Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 18th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. I would ask people to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent. And we do have apologies received this morning from Fulton McGregor. The first item on the agenda is the fourth replacement crossing. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown, uh, David Climey, the Project Director for the fourth replacement crossing team, Sally Cox, the chair of the fourth crossing bridge constructors, and Michael Martin, the project director. Welcome. Uh, we look forward to receiving an update. And Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening uh, statement to bring us up to date from the uh, report that we received from David, which was dated the 29th of April, I believe? Okay, thank you very much, convener. Thanks for the opportunity to update the committee. Uh, I will provide a brief update uh, and then obviously welcome any discussion and questions from myself or David, Michael or Sally. Uh, on March the 29th, I advised the committee that the Queen's Ferry crossing is now forecast open to traffic between mid-July and the end of August, depending on weather conditions. Uh, that followed the fourth crossing bridge contractors advising that a May 2017 opening date was no longer achievable due to the effects of the weather, particularly wind, beyond that which was foreseen by them in June 2016. At that time, all members agreed that the safety and quality of the construction work should be the guiding principles in determining the programme to completion. So both I and Transport Scotland also would want to continue to stress to FCBC that the continued focus on maintaining health and safety as our top priority, uh, which I know is at the forefront uh, of everything that they do. Since my last appearance at this committee on the 29th of March and since the last written update, as you mentioned, convener, on the 28th of April, eh, I'm pleased to update you today on the significant progress which has continued on the North Approach Roads and the Queensferry Crossing. I went to the site on the May the 19th to see for myself the progress being made uh, in the favourable weather conditions on that day. In fact, there wasn't a breath of wind at the top of the towers, which I'm told is extremely unusual. Uh, but I was at that time hugely impressed by the progress that's been made across all the key activities on the project. Uh, pleased to inform the committee that all the tower cranes, as you may well be aware, have now been completely removed. Uh, you will recall that that activity was significantly affected from the start of the year due to the fewer than expected weather windows required to complete their removal. Uh, the upper deck tower false work removal has also been completed as FCBC have taken advantage of the available weather windows during April and May. All the expansion joints have now been installed and the final deck concrete pours on the south approach viaduct have been completed. Uh, the installation of wind barriers is also nearing completion across the full length of the Queen's Ferry crossing, a very important design feature which will deliver a significant benefit to the travelling public if you think about the times when the existing uh, fourth uh, road bridge has to be closed to high-sided vehicles during high winds. Uh, the waterproofing and road surfing is continuing on the deck of the Queen's Ferry crossing as planned and FCBC continue to progress the finishing works relating to the stay cables such as the guide pipes, dampers, deviators and tension rings. On the south side, the M90 south side approach road and the A90 public transport link are both ready for tie-in and use when required. On the north side, ferry toll junction construction is nearing completion and the ferry toll park and ride construction is complete with the bus circulatory area now open. Uh, as I confirmed to the committee on March 29th, the overall project cost to the taxpayer remains within the range of £1.325 billion to £1.35 billion, uh, securing the quarter of a billion pounds of savings released since the construction started. Uh, community relations and public engagement continue to be hugely positive, and the project continues to attract a great deal of interest from a variety of stakeholders, including the general public, schools, colleges, universities, as well as industry, international visitors and the media. Uh, the successful schools programme has attracted well over 20,000 school pupils from throughout Scotland in just four academic years, and the project exhibition at the dedicated contact and education centre has attracted well over 20,000 visitors. The project team also continued to regularly provide presentations which have been attended by over 30,000 people. Uh, all interested in hearing more about the project and the latest in the construction of the crossing. Uh, the overall outreach and education programme has now attracted well over 70,000 individuals across our activities. Uh, these activities will continue into the future and will ensure there's a lasting educational legacy from the project, inspiring, we hope, future generations to be inspired by the innovations of what is a world-class project 
uh, and learning more about the science, the technology, engineering, arts and mathematics related to the project. As you can imagine, the interest in the public has also increased as construction has progressed, and now the public are increasingly interested in how they can be part of celebrations to commemorate the completion and opening of this iconic structure. So the project team have been considering the full range of potential options available to ensure that the public have the opportunity to appropriately celebrate the completion and the opening of this world-class bridge. Uh, and FCBC will provide Transport Scotland with an update on their programme to open the Queen's Ferry crossing to traffic in the coming weeks. And following that, announcements will be made regarding the opening celebrations planned for the Queen's Ferry crossing. It remains on schedule, convener, to open to traffic between mid-July and the end of August 2017. Uh, as I've said before, fourth uh, crossing bridge constructors continue to strive for the earliest possible opening date to traffic. And I can also assure the committee that everyone involved in the project remains fully focused on completing the project to the high quality achieved so far, and just as importantly, uh, as safely as possible. And as Michael Martin mentioned to me recently, health and safety has no finishing line. Uh, so given that, uh, convener, I'm happy to try and answer any questions that uh, you may have for myself, uh, for David, Michael or Sally. Okay, uh, I think the first question is going to come from John Mason. Uh, th thanks, convener, and thanks very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for your update. Uh, so we're talking about the opening being between six weeks, roughly, and 12 weeks ahead from now. Can we be any more specific on that? Uh, no, I think we've said uh, there was a reason, as I said the last time at the committee, for that range being given rather than a specific date. I think we've learned uh, that uh, that's the best way to try and uh, present to the public the expected opening time for that. Um, we do have that window of six weeks between mid-July and the end of August. We will try, as I've just said, to open it as early as possible, uh, but there are still enough variables, in particular the weather. For example, yesterday was a uh, to most of us a very good day, but uh, the water or the rain uh, that um, happened during the course of the day meant that uh, the waterproofing that had been done could not then be overlaid with blacktop because of that. So there are still too many variables for us to be more specific. We expect to be, and we're going to have to be specific in the next few weeks about this, and we will do that. Um, but until we have got real confidence about the actual opening date, we don't want to go public with that. Okay, thanks. I mean, ha have there been other weather issues over the last few weeks since the last update? Well, from my point of view, I mean, the reports I have, and I get regular updates from the um, uh, team, is that, uh, yes, there are still issues, but if you think back to the mm. cranes, which were the big issue last time I came to the committee, once they'd been taken down below a certain level, it was possible to work in higher wind conditions than it is at the top. And also... Um, I suppose on the plus side, just because of the lengthening days, that's allowed more of a window for work to be done. But there has still continued to be, even on what appear to be some quite benign days, especially later on in the day, issues with wind and sometimes issues uh, with uh, rain, all of which is pretty standard for this kind of uh, project, although it is taking place in the middle of the fourth estuary, which um, uh, adds to it. So yes, there are continuing problems, probably nothing beyond that which we'd expect um, in terms of the nature of the weather conditions, but they're still there. And you said you get regular updates. What, how does it work? Could the, the contractors kind of tell the management team, what, every week or so, and then they update you every week? Or how oh, does that work? Uh, David is there the whole time. Uh, he's, he's visiting the project the whole time and uh, talks with Michael uh, regularly. I get from David uh, a, a weekly um, update. Uh, he provides updates, as you know, to this committee as well. But I would be talking to um, David or... Michelle Rennie, who's also here with us today from Transport Scotland, sometimes two, three times a week, um, sometimes less than that. But we certainly get the regular updates, regardless of how often I talk to them. You can imagine the pace is quickening a bit towards the end of this project now. The public interest is substantially increasing, so I'm asked more and more questions about it. Very nice questions, um, just like this committee. But um, So with that level of interest, even if it wasn't the case I wanted to be kept up to date, I would have to refer to them regularly. So yes. there's a regular dialogue going on. Right. And I mean, all going well then, we're not expecting any weather would be disruptive in the next six weeks or so? I, I think we are expecting weather to be disruptive, to be honest, but uh, not beyond uh, what we would have expected if you had a very prolonged period of very high winds, and that would obviously give us issues. Similarly, with a very wet period, especially now that we're into the surface, uh, surface processes, there are, and I don't pretend to know it all, there are a number of different elements of the surface that have to be taken into account, and they are um, weather dependent. But this was all pretty much anticipated, but weather is still uh, something which can present us with challenges, no doubt about that. Okay, thank you. 
Well, I'd piece. add a little to that. And just in terms of, of, of the weather, um, we've, certainly April and May particularly, um, we have been fortunate in that it's been very dry. I think that's been commented on in, in the press, and that has helped us in terms of the waterproofing and the surfacing. Um, I think we've had about 20% of the average rainfall has, has fallen in Edinburgh over that period. Now, there's always the risk that that average is going to get back to where it should be. So, obviously, it, and we have a relatively short period to go, as you said, between 6 and 13 weeks. So, should suddenly that, that average swing back to where it it would be in the long term, that obviously could have an impact on the, the waterproofing and the surfacing. Mm -hmm. So we have allowed for that, and that's why we're still sticking to the window. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, do you want to come in on it's that relevant. particular? Yeah. Yes. It's Sorry. just relevance to the uh, maximising the opportunities. Given that we're now operating much longer daylight hours, has there been any change in the shift of the working patterns? For example, as we know, winds often pick up in the afternoon, so have people been starting earlier at, say, 6 a.m. to take advantage of the daylight hours? Yeah, I'll, I'll let David come back on that, but yes, that's the case. And in fact, on one of the activities, the tension rings, which is not at great height, as you can imagine, eh, those not only are continuing through the daylight hours, but actually right through the night. But yeah, I think there's been full advantage taken of the the, open, the, the longer daylight hours. I don't know if you want to come yeah, on that. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think, I think FCBC have been very proactive in looking at just what is the right time of day to work. Um, now, once the cranes were removed, that took away one significant um, area where we'd had big exclusion zones where that was the only activity that could happen. So once the cranes had been removed, obviously that opened up more areas that could be worked on simultaneously. Um, the point with the, with the wind is that what we've, we've seen typically on the 4th is you can get it absolutely flat calm in the morning, then in the afternoon the wind picks up, it's almost like opening a door at about 11 o'clock in the morning. The wind will then blow quite hard, say 30 to 35 miles an hour, until around 9 o'clock in the evening, and then it's almost like closing the door again. So what's happened is that the, the key activities that are wind dependent, such as fitting the tension rings, working on the tops of the cables, that's been put effectively under a back shift. So that actually starts uh, late in the evening. And with the longer daylight hours, it means that they can work effectively through that period. So there's been a lot of flexibility built into maximising the use of the daylight hours and also the pattern of the wind during the day. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is Peter. Yes, thanks. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, are FCBC subject to any penalty for missing the contractual opening date? And if so, what might that be? Uh, I'll, I'll let David, it's, much of that is uh, commercially um, confidential, but I'll let David answer that. Sure. Well, so I wouldn't mention penalties, because I think penalties are something that we would not typically put in a contract. There are, there are liquidated damages, that's how we usually describe these um, things that are put into a contract, um, which are if, if the project should overrun the agreed contractual date, there's a, a loss of benefit effectively in not having the project delivered. So you, you assess what those uh, liquidated damages are and they have to put into the contract. Mm. Now also obviously within any contract, there are also uh, avenues for the contractor to apply for an extension of time if events have occurred which they are not liable for. So it's, it's a, it's a two-way street. Yes, mm. there are potentially liquidated damages if contractual date is not met, but there are also avenues for the contractor to apply for an extension of time if events have occurred which would um, entitle them to an extension of time. So the, the contract does have mechanisms to allow for both those things. Um, as Mr Brown has correctly said, obviously, it's a, we're on a live contract. Um, there are discussions going on on the subject, and we're not actually at the point where we've passed the contractual date yet. We're mm. close to it, mm. but we're not past it yet. But yes, there are mechanisms for it, should that prove necessary. Can I ask, is there, is there a, a, also a mechanism for, for, for the contractors to recoup extra costs that might be involved in, in running past the time as well? In that, you know, you've still, you've still hundreds of staff on site, and if the job had been done, it would have, they would have obviously been, been, been finished, their contracts would have been finished, you wouldn't be paying them. That's true. But the way the contracts are set up is that there are some... Um, aspects that are allowed to have an extension of time, some allow an extension of time and also cost, and it depends which, which activities it is that are affected. But as I've reassured the committee before, um, nothing has come up so far that would entitle the contractor to claim extra cost for mm. any overrun that will happen. So that's why we're still confident of, of maintaining the original budget um, that we're, we're, uh, we have at the moment. So yes, there may be an, an element of time, mm. but we're confident that there will be no element of cost that will be attached to that. I think it's worth okay. adding that the contractor is currently bearing the cost, uh, or will bear the cost, to the tune of around about a million pounds a day, I, th I think I'm right in saying, um, in terms of the additional costs which are being incurred. So mm. obviously it's in the interest of the contractor, or it will be if they go past the contract completion date, which is what we expect, for them to bear that cost. So every incentive there for the contractor to get this finished as quickly as possible. 
Um, okay. yeah. can, can I just come back on liquidated damages, uh, just first of all, is, is that obviously that would be extremely difficult to prove because there is a, there is a crossing that is open and operational already. So actually proving a loss would be virtually impossible. Uh, I wonder, first of all, do you accept that as, as a premise? As a premise, yes, um, but also when you negotiate any contract, one of the elements of negotiating the contract is what the liquidated damages would be. And that's, it's important that when you enter into a contract, you have a level of liquidated damages that the parties sign on to. And as part of the original um, competitive dialogue that we had when we were um, negotiating the contract itself, the level of liquidated damages was one of the factors that was agreed as part of the, the contract negotiations. So the, there were several things that were negotiated similarly. There was a level of bonding for the contract. There was the level of liquidated damages. And there was also the, the whole payment schedule. All of those were di discussed in great detail and decided in advance of awarding the contract. So these discussions were had in advance of the contract and should not then be, come into effect post-contract. Uh, and I totally accept that, and I'm, I'm sure people understand that liquidated damages will, will be, in some ways, it's better to keep them low on the basis that you'll get a better overall price for the contract. So that, that, that's one thing. Can I ask, have you given um, uh, the contractor any extensions to time uh, at this date? I think there are discussions going on on that subject at the moment. Um, obviously, it's a live contract, so I'd rather not comment on that at the moment. So at the moment, that there are discussions going on, but no extensions of time have been given as at today's date. As, as I said, it's a live contract, discussions are ongoing, so I, I can't answer that question. I can't comment on that. Right, okay, Mike. Thank you. Yes, I understand perfectly uh, the issue of um, commercial and confidence, and it's a live contract. But bearing in mind that we know what the price of the contract is, it's published, when will we know, uh, when will the taxpayer know um, when, in other words, will it be published that uh, if there is any money coming back to the taxpayer as a result of the contract? So, I don't want to know now, but when will we know? When will there be any further money coming back to the yeah. taxpayer? Because obviously a significant amount has already come back. Yeah. Um, the discussions, um, the way we have a very good dialogue going on, we have a very good relationship between the client and the contractor. Those discussions are actually taking place. Uh, we had a session yesterday, in fact, uh, talking about this and trying to establish a time scale for exactly what that should be. Because I think in terms of, in terms of finishing the physical construction pro process, that's one thing. But in finishing the commercial discussions, that's equally important. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's important for the contractor to know exactly what they're going to pay out. And as you say, it's important for the taxpayer as well mm -hmm. to be able to draw a line under the contract and not have it dragged out for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. So our, my, my personal intention is that we'll have that established very shortly after we actually open to traffic. The two will be linked closely together. Right. So we won't have long to wait in that? that no, case. we're not expecting it to drag out for months because A, there isn't a great deal to talk about and B, there's a good commercial a good contractual relationship between us. Okay. So there's a brief follow-up from Stuart. I, I presume we're not including in the remarks just made the period of warranty where there is, there is a period, I can't remember what it is, that the uh, contractors retain liabilities and it's a number of years. Uh, so therefore, the close down, the final accounting, really can only be after the warranty period. That is true, but there's a five-year defects liability yep. period attached to the project. But in terms of the final account settlement, that will allow for an element of um, potential expenditure over that five-year period as well. Because the, the budget we've always established has been for the full project, from the day it first started with the land acquisition and so on, right through to the end of the five-year defects liability period. So any commercial settlement we reach will include allowances for anything that may have to happen in that five-year period. And we also have a retention bond from the contractor that is in place throughout that period as well. Uh, but, but it would be fair to say both parties could find themselves having to commit to payments under the terms of the warranty. To a small Dep degree, yes. Depending on where the liability for whatever the defect is lies. That is possible. Yep. That's fine. Okay. Question is from Gail. Thank you, convener. Good morning. We've heard before that um, there is a high level of community engagement with local businesses and residents. Have there been any local concerns raised since we last spoke to you? 
There are none that have been raised with me, and sometimes will be raised at the um, level of the community and with the contractors through the public engagement processes um, that we've uh, established. I think there was one issue in, in relation to taxes, but there's been none raised with me, but perhaps uh, David could mention if there's any others that he's aware of. Sure. Well, certainly the, the community forums that we've established, um, you'll remember that we mentioned that the two forums had actually been combined in the, the autumn of last year because there had been relatively little to talk about. Um, there is actually a forum due to take place tonight, and in advance of that, the, the community um, groups involved hadn't presented us any issues in advance that they wanted us to consider, which I think is very positive. And at the last community forum um, back in February, the, really the focus very much was switching to, um, they were very appreciative of how the interaction had worked throughout the construction period, and they were beginning to think to, well, once, once we're gone, as it were, how does, how does that continue in the, in the area? Um, so there's, it's really a question of, we, we, we've been right with them, we've been there all the time, they've known who to contact, we have the hotline, we have the contact and education centre, is that going to continue, how, how does that transition into the future once it hands over to the operating company? So I think it's, it's not so much now an issue of immediate concerns, it's how does this move forward in the future and maintain that high level of, of the bar that we've set. And um, have there been any discussions or are there any plans on how that engagement might continue? Is the forum going to be still in place, or are you going to do it in another way? What's going to happen is we've, we've also established in parallel a fourth bridges forum, and that deals with the, the, the railway bridge, the fourth road bridge, and that will be led by the fourth bridges operating company. So what we've done is they've been coming to our community uh, forums as well to start that transition process into the fourth bridges forum, um, because very much the, 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 um, the guardianship of it effectively will move from uh, the, the project team to the fourth bridge's operating company, just exactly as the, the operation and maintenance of the, of the bridge moves to them as well. So it's appropriate that that's the, the right place for the, the, uh, the contact to sit. So there's been a good engagement there, and I think there'll be a good transfer of both knowledge and information uh, through to that group going forward. Okay. Also, we have the contact and education centre, which will remain there, and that anticipates the continuing high level of interest. If uh, we think again that you have three different bridges from three different centuries, each of them pretty unique in their own right, um, and having world heritage status, there's going to be a lot of interest. We anticipated that. So, in addition to the general public interest, which can be fed through the contact and education centre, we're also updating the um, engaging with communities booklet that's setting out the various forms of communication which we expect to happen after the open and that includes contact details, meetings, messaging, website details, so that uh, bridge users, local communities, uh, and the general public are provided with the appropriate communication information channels. The question is, is well put because we do expect to have, probably even heightened as initially, heightened interest on that which we've had so far. The public are very, very interested in this project. Have there been any discussions with uh, Visit Scotland about promotion as a tourist destination? That was part of the discussions that we had in the build-up to the application for the World Heritage um, status. I took that into account, the likely level of public interest. As I say, the unique nature of the, and um, world-renowned nature of the railway bridge, plus the bridge that we're currently building is unique in the world. It's the biggest of its type in the world. So that was part of it. And the World Heritage status itself is a huge tourist draw. People will go to where they know to be World Heritage sites. So that was part of that discussion at that time. And it will continue to be part of that discussion. Okay, thanks. Um, just, just before we leave that, um, um, maybe if I could ask David, the old Admiralty building that is currently being used as offices, I believe, by, the, by some of the contractors, which, could you just remind the committee what's going to happen to that building? Certainly, you're referring to, to Admiral's House, which is very close to the, the yes. north abutment of the bridge. Um, at the moment, that's, that's owned by the, the Scottish Government, uh, and that was taken into the government ownership back in, I think, the mid-1990s, when the previous project was, was thought to happen. Um, in the intervening period, it was, it was actually leased out to a, to a company, um, and the intention is that once the, the construction work is finished, um, which, as you say, it's currently being used as a site office, we will then um, um, clean it up and renovate it ready to put back on the market again. Now, whether we put it back on the market to, to sell it or to establish a lease again, uh, we have not yet decided. Uh, with the proximity to the bridge, um, it's possible, I think, that we might want to lease it rather than sell it, so we actually keep control of the building itself and the area around it. It, it, it is a listed building? It is a listed building, that's correct, it, yes. Uh, certainly when uh, the committee went out to visit it, it was... Um I think the description would be tired and, and, and growing trees from the gutters, um, which is perhaps not the best advertisement next to a 
heritage site which the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned. I think it's pretty unlikely people will see that from the, um, <laughs> the, the bridges where you are because of where it is, but your interest in the property is noted, Convener, but we'll, um, we, I, did say, I did say to Transport Scotland at the very start that uh, ministers would want to be involved in the decision about that. It's a pretty unique uh, property, although impacted by the proximity of the, of the road, which is right there now. It was previously, I think, used for corporate hospitality by somebody in central Scotland. So we will look to... Um, we'll look to um, that when the decision is ready, and I think they're probably right not to concentrate on cleaning the gutters there once they get on with the bridge, um, but we are aware of the, and also on the other side of the river, the uh, Enchgarvey House as well, another very important building, so we have those very much in mind. It, it, it would be sad to see a historic building I ignored in the process. I think the next question is from Rhoda. Hi. Um, when do you expect um, the... the public transport strategy to be complete and how will that look uh, different from what is available in public transport at the moment? Well we have, um, as you know, the existing bridge will be reserved for public transport. Um, we are still looking at the actual practicalities of how this works but it's likely to be the case that um, for an initial period um, all traffic will have to use um, the new bridge and then a public transport revert back under traffic management um, initially. You can imagine you have a new bridge there, so people, uh, which will be part of the motorway network, so the speed limit would be 70 miles an hour, but that initially will be constrained to tell people to get used to the bridge. And then it will revert back to what was established at the start uh, and in legislation, which was the use of the existing bridge as a public transport corridor. Um, so we've had engagement with the bus operators, uh, throughout the project, through the Public Transport Working Group. Um, we had a dedicated bus driver training session held in February, attended by 18 members of the local and national bus companies, uh, the Confederation of Passenger Transport, the regional transport authorities. Um, and all bus-related features will be explained in detail with the various operating regimes which can be adopted, such as those during high wind events. I mentioned earlier on how High winds, as we all know, can affect high-sided vehicles, which would include double-decker buses, obviously, on the existing structure. Um, so those presentation materials have been provided for those present to pass on to bus drivers. Once the opening's taken place, uh, bus services will be able to take advantage of the dedicated public transport corridor, which goes from Ferry Toll Park and ride right across the Force Road Bridge uh, and via associated public transport links south of the Forth. Um, but we also expect that will improve journey time reliability through the corridor. Um, we're making improvements to the park and ride at Ferry Toll. Hard shoulder bus lanes on the M90 and M9 also enable buses to bypass general traffic should congestion occur. And use of the Queen's Ferry Crossing's hard shoulders, as I mentioned, when high winds affect the fourth road bridge will give us additional capacity. We'll also have bus lanes around the Ferry Toll Junction. So responsibility for cross forth bus services will be a matter for the individual bus operating companies and they'll determine their own routes and timetables according to their business. Uh, but we expect to see a significant improvement in journey time reliability for public transport using the crossing. And um, I may have misheard you, but you appeared to say initially all traffic would use the new crossing, including bus traffic. When will the old bridge be used for, for public transport, or is that just for ferry toll? It seems that's a huge bridge for, for very little. Uh, the new bridge, uh, so the existing bridge will be used, it'd be a matter of weeks and I'll perhaps ask David to come back and that's still under discussion just now, but initially um, uh, we're talking about a matter of um, three, four weeks possibly that all traffic will use a new bridge and then the public transport side of it, buses, um, taxis and so on, will use the um, existing bridge uh, after that. Of course, in future years we'll carry out some repairs to the existing bridge which we have not carried out like the expansion joints, which are not critical to the safety, but you'll know that slap, slap, slap noise that you get when you go across the existing bridge. We will work on those over the coming um, years, and that will be because to do that now would cause massive disruption. So I don't know if David wants to give a bit more detail on, on how long we expect that to last. Though. Yeah, certainly. Um, th and the reason for that is that there's uh, when we move the traffic onto the Queensferry crossing initially, there's the last little tie-in to do of the, the, the ramps from Ferry Toll up onto the fourth road bridge, which we can't do until the traffic is out of the way. 
So in order to be able to do that, it is, it is a period of three or four weeks, that's all we're talking about. So for that period, we'll put all traffic onto the Queen's Ferry Crossing. And what that does is that it has two benefits. One is that I'm sure when people drive across the Queen's Ferry Crossing for the first time, they're going to want to have a, a good look at what they're driving across, the, what they see from it. And certainly in conjunction with our traffic management working group and the police, their initial suggestion was that when we initially open it, we should keep it under a temporary traffic management regime. So we run it perhaps at 50 miles an hour rather than 70 miles an hour, just because people will want to be looking at what's going on. So to avoid any confusion as to who goes where, everything will go onto the Queen's Ferry Crossing. It will run at 50 miles an hour for about three to four weeks. At that point, the last time will be done on the north side. The Fort Road Bridge will then act as the full public transport link, as that has been described. And at that point, the, the, the Queen's Ferry Crossing can become the motorway and the road order will become live to make it a motorway. Okay, and when, when that happens, will there be more public um, buses and the like, you know, from ferry to... Uh, what is the difference in public transport that people will, will see? Well, the feedback from, from the bus operators, firstly, has been that the, the ferry toll uh, modifications that we've made are being very beneficial. That's what's working well with the larger turning circle and the area for the buses to, to park. Um, but what the bus companies have generally said is they want to see how the, the new crossing operates in terms of journey times, in terms of whether the, the queues are less at peak times, and they will then review that based on what, what they see and what the public demand is to then review the, the whole strategy. But I think they want to see just how it operates before they commit to any additional services at this point. But ultimately, that is, of course, for their choice to make. So this... Uh, right, uh, uh, you... I'd like to bring Richard in because he's got a few questions on public transport as well. So if I could just bring uh, Richard in. Yes. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, basically, you said about the, the, you know, the, when the new bridge opens, everything will go over that bridge. Uh, but you also said that double-deckers, uh, then eventually single-deckers, double-deckers, will go on the old bridge. When it's high winds, what's going to happen then? I think that's the point I was making about the hard shoulders of the new uh, crossing. So if you have a situation, and I'm happy to be corrected if I've not got this right, if you have a situation where high winds happen, which traditionally would have meant that um, high-sided vehicles like double-deckers and large trucks can't cross the existing fourth crossing, then the uh, new Queensferry crossing through the hard shoulders will be able to take... They'll already be taking the high HGVs and so on, but they can also take high-sided vehicles like double-decker buses. Yeah. So that gives us that extra resilience. Um, but to, to, the norm will be that those both double-decker and single-decker buses, once that initial three- to four-week period has passed, will use the existing bridge. And to go back to the previous point, in terms of journey time reliability, you just have to think about what a bus coming out of ferry toll has to contend with sometimes now at peak hours. And the difference will be being able to get straight across that bridge because it will be them and other public transport users using it and them alone. Way back when the, the other bridge was, Fourth Road Bridge was opened, uh, uh, as a teenager, I could remember it. Um, a lot of people were walked across it. A lot of people, the, the you know the, the Fort Road Bridge, walked across it. A lot of people drove slowly across it. So what uh, uh, are you basically you going to be doing to ensure? And you faced criticism yesterday about signage. Um, will we ensure that uh, you know signage is up to stand, the standard as required, so that people know? Um, you know, and you're saying, uh, Mr. Clymy, that you can't, you won't be going at 70, you can go at 50. Um, so will signage be up to standard and will we ensure over the next couple of weeks when it, it is open that people know where they're going? Can I say, first of all, that it's, it's going to be the case that for in terms of pedestrians, nothing is going to change. The only way they can cross just now is through the existing force road bridge, and that won't change. They'll not be able to go across the new Queen's Ferry crossing by foot. So there won't be a change um, for them. And in terms of signage, what we have in this location is a very substantial integrated traffic management system. You'll see the gantries with journey time information and all sorts of other information on them, and that's on both sides of the bridge. So um, compared to the discussion that we had yesterday, uh, which is not similar, um, you're going to have an awful lot of information for drivers. But in terms of just intuitively, people are not going to have to change what they're doing if they want to walk across the bridge. In terms of driving slower, I mean, you currently have to obey this, the lower speed limit on the existing bridge. What will become new after the initial period will be you'll be able to travel at 70 miles an hour over the, exist, over the Queensferry crossing, which you can't do 
in terms of the new crossing. And obviously the signage, you're right to say, we have to tell people that when they first go there, that's temporary, they'll be able to travel at 50 miles an hour for the reasons you've mentioned and that David's mentioned. But in due course, they'll be able to travel the same as elsewhere in the country on the motorway network, 70 miles an hour. Um, I'm going to bring in John here because you had a particular question. <coughs> Thank you, Gavina. Good morning, panel. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, there's people commute across the, the fourth by uh, bicycle, and uh, a number of them have raised concerns about changes to the cycle routes um, serving the, the current fourth bridge. And that's particularly the case at the, the ferry toll end. And they've raised issues about poor signage and road surfaces uh, and the fact that it's an indirect route. Now, I appreciate that there will be temporary arrangements, but what assurances can you give about the improved cycle provision on the crossings, please? Uh, well, I've travelled that by, uh, by bike myself, and um, it, my views has been massive, even since I did it, I think, three or four years ago, it's been massive improvements in terms of the cycle route that's there, especially when you come onto the south side of it. Um, I don't know if David wants to come back in terms of the, the signage and what we're doing to work with uh, through the public transport strategy. Yeah, yes, I would. I, I, mm -hmm. Because I, I think one of the questions uh, which logically follows in there is, is, is in the transition period, in the four weeks, I think, where, you, where, where you've indicated things will be going on, mm -hmm. I think John would, and the committee would be interested to hear what's going to happen to cyc for cyclists at that specific time. Certainly. Well, certainly for clarity, let me deal with that point first. Uh, pedestrians and cyclists will still have full access to the fourth road bridge throughout, so there will be no interruption to the pedestrian and cyclist access to the fourth road bridge. I'm purely talking about road traffic for the temporary period. Now, in terms of the ferry toll area particularly, um, we're reaching the very final stage of work on the ferry toll roundabout at the moment. So in the last month in particular, um, the points you raised have been particularly um, accurate because we've been putting a lot of the last surfacing into position and there's been a lot of temporary rerouting for both pedestrians and cyclists. Now, I've actually walked through that area myself once a week for the past four weeks and the route has changed every time. But to be fair to FCBC, I've got to say that the signage that's been there has been clear and there's been a lot of signage and perhaps sometimes there's been too much signage that it's been overcomplicated. But there's always been a route through. Sometimes it has been circuitous. But what is happening is that this coming weekend, we actually have closures on the ferry toll generatory, which we've publicised on our website, as we always do. And that's going to be the, the, the final areas of road surfacing being put in place around the new ferry toll roundabout, as well as the finalising of, of the pedestrian and cyclist routes. So during June, we expect to finish off the work in that area. So it will come down to the, the permanent solution will be there, with including all the pedestrian, new pedestrian crossings, cycle tracks, signage and so on. And what we're also um, going to do, and this has been suggested to us by the community, it's a very good idea. You'll be aware that we've issued you with a, our road user's guide, which told all the people who are driving which bridge they could use and when. Uh, in parallel with that, we're now going to produce a cyclist and pedestrian guide as well, which will be a, a map that will show exactly where the routes are, exactly where they can go, and if you want to get from A to B, which route to take, if you want to go from C to D, which route to take, and we'll be publishing that in advance of the uh, opening to traffic. Okay, that's very reassuring. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, Mike, I think you have a question. Yes, um, I go to the last question. I think um, I know we haven't got a date yet for the opening of the of the bridge, obviously. But uh, when can we expect to hear your plans on marking the opening of the crossing? It's really just knowing when we'll be able to hear what they are, rather than for a specific date. <coughs> My view is we should do that at the same time as we have the um, uh, certainty around the opening dates. Um, I mean, obviously, as your question implies, a great deal of discussion has gone on up till now. There's a lot of people getting in touch with Transport Scotland and with the government about suggestions and ideas for the opening. There's a huge amount of interest, but I think that's best done uh, when we know the opening date. So I think that those two things happen at the same time. Uh, I'll give the final question to John. We go back to the buses. Um, if, if it's faster for the bus to go over the new bridge as compared to the old bridge, is it compulsory for the buses to go over the old bridge or can they choose to go over the new bridge? Well, faster is, I, I'm not sure that it will be faster. Even if you're able to go at 70 miles an hour, if you've got a dedicated public transport route where you're not having to uh, pass through with general traffic, 
some moot point as to which one would be faster for the um, uh, public transport buses. No, but it's certainly in terms of the there's nothing to stop a bus from going over either, either bridge. It can go over the Queen's Ferry Crossing if it wishes, wishes to go over the Queen's Ferry Crossing. Um, right. But obviously, if you're running a, a bus service, you'll tend to publish what the route is, and therefore where the, where the stops are at either end would depend on which bridge it crosses. But there's nothing within the regulations that says buses must use the fourth road bridge. They, they can use the Queen's Ferry Crossing if they wish to. If they can go on a motorway, they can go over the Queen's Ferry Crossing. OK, that's great. Stops on the new crossing. Yeah. Well, no, I got that. Yes. So, okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Um, sure. Richard wants to come in with a very brief one, and that really is the final question. We built a new bridge because we had problems with the old bridge, and I've asked you this question before. Do you intend, or is there any, any intention, to re renew the, the structure of the old bridge, uh, the, the cable ties, etc., as and when? Well, it wasn't just because of the... You're right to say that's what initiated it. Um, the decision by the Scottish Government to go ahead with the new bridge was because of the condensation in the cables and the prospect that we were told at the time, which has transpired not to be true, that by 2017 HGVs wouldn't be able to use the existing bridge. That's not happened because some of the works that have been carried out in the cables have found out that uh, it's possible to, I think, achieve some dehumidification and, and help with that. So that's increased the life uh, span of the existing bridge. But it was also to do with the fact that the existing bridge was carrying far more traffic than it was designed to carry out, uh, to carry. So that's why the, and, and also the questions of capacity. In relation to what we intend to do with the um, existing uh, crossing, it had a, a, an absolutely thorough and full health check when we had that problem last year, I think it was. Um, so a huge amount of work was done then. We know there is still further work to do, so I mentioned the expansion joints. Um, and there'll be other things which would, had we closed the bridge to traffic, would have been very um, uh, disruptive to traffic, which we'll now be able to do with much less disruption on the existing bridge. But there's nothing that's substantial that's in qu questions of safety or even the longevity of the bridge. It's had a very thorough health check very recently. We know there's more work to do, and as ever, there'll be maintenance work to do, but nothing more substantial than that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I think the, this possibly, hopefully, will be the last evidence session uh, that we will have on, 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 the, on the bridge. In fact, when I last said that on the on earlier March, it proved to be to be incorrect. But I do. He's coming in on the 28th of June. Oh, I'm told you're coming in on the 28th of June after the election, probably to give us the exact date at the back end of August, no doubt. But um, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to hearing the exact date and what all the plans are for the opening. Sally and Michael, I'm I'm sorry you didn't get a question to specifically ask. You you may be delighted, but. Thank you very much for the evidence that you gave us this morning. I briefly suspend the meeting to allow witnesses to change. Sorry.
Good morning. I'd like to reconvene the meeting. We're going to move now on to agenda item two, which is the food and drink strategy. This is our first evidence session on food and drink. In March, the Food and Drink Partnership published its vision for growth in farming, fishing and the food and drink sector by 2030. I'd like to welcome uh, a, a large panel, and, and I'm going to do it per the list, not in the order. So first of all, James Withers, Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink. Uh, Patrick Hughes, Head of Seafood Scotland. David Thompson, uh, the Chief Executive of the Food and Drink Federation Scotland. Scott Walker, Chief Executive of NFU Scotland. Scott Lansborough, Chief Executive of Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation. And James Graham, Chief Executive of the Scottish Agricultural um, Organisation Society. Now, James, I think you, you have been um, targeted to, to make a very brief opening statement if, you, if you'd like to make one. Sure, okay, thank you. Mo morning, everyone. Um, I'll just give uh, just a couple of minutes of, of background, I suppose, to the strategy and, and, and who's in front of you. Um, Scotland Food and Drink is an industry body, but at our heart, we're a collaborative partnership uh, and we bring together um, all the main sectors of the farming, fish, and food and drink industry uh, alongside partners in the public sector to drive forward a strategic plan for, for the industry. Um, we have a strategic board who are the co authors of the strategy. So, if you've got, I don't know if you've got the copy of the strategy in front of you, but, but f certainly six of us, along with uh, a number of our counterparts, are co authors of, the, of Ambition 2030, as we've titled the, the strategy. Um, Scotland Food and Drink, we're a membership body as well in our own right. We've got about 370 members who are mostly food and drink manufacturers, much like a number of the other bodies here today who are membership bodies. This is the second strategy we've, we've produced. So, the first one ran from 2007 to 2017. Uh, the starting point then was very different. This was a sector that was marked by static growth, um, a, a relatively low level of um, uh, ambition and a relatively low level of success, I have to say. The, the second strategy, this new one, which is a roadmap out to 2030, uh, is a very different starting point in the sense that, that food and drink has become one of the best performing sectors of the economy. We, we broke the earlier targets we set. It's Scotland's fastest growing export. Um, but there are still some challenges, but we, we start, so we certainly don't start from a, a burning platform. Um, just a little bit of context, obviously there's a huge amount of uncertainty around at the moment and we had a genuine debate about how we try and plan a very long term strategy against the backdrop of Brexit, of Trump, of an ongoing debate over Scotland's constitutional future, um, but we were quite clear that you know, uncertainty is not new for business, there's always uncertainty. Um, other countries around the world were planning and planning hard. The Irish, New Zealanders, Scandinavian were, were planning hard for their future. And ultimately, while the, while the big, I suppose, geopolitical events are totally out with our control, there are a number of factors that were very much in our control. So how we develop our brand for, for farming, fishing, food and drink in Scotland, how we invest in our capability and how we build our markets. So we've built a strategy founded on, on those things. Um, we've also recognised within the strategy where we've been less successful over the last few years. So the level of confidence and profitability at the farm gate, for example, is not where we need it to be. We haven't been successful in turning that around. How we um, create farming, fishing, food and drink as a career destination of first choice, we're still some way uh, off that. The connection to our research community, uh, and we think there's more that industry and government can do in partnership around Scotland's diet, dietary and health uh, challenges that it has. Um, so the, the strategy is founded on a vision that by 2030 we think we can make farming, fish and food and drink Scotland's most viable sector. We'd like it to be uh, you know, a model of collaboration uh, and responsible growth and that's the vision we've kind of founded it on. Very, very quickly, what, you know, in one minute what the building blocks of the strategy are. Building our brand for Scotland, this land of food and drink identity. We think our brand is our fortune. Most countries around the world think they've got the best food and drink in the world. We would say the same too, but we actually think we've probably got the best story and a phenomenal provenance story, uh, but we need to go out and tell that. In terms of markets, we want to sell more Scottish food and drink in Scotland, across the rest of the UK and internationally. And there are three key areas for us in terms of building capability. Uh, investing in our skills and people, investing in our supply chain and investing in, in innovation as well. And then finally, I suppose the kind of industry we want to be, um, you know, our, our view is that, you know, if you strip away the various factors of growth over the last wee while, the single most important ingredient has been collaboration. So collaboration between industry bodies with the public sector to, and indeed actually at company level who often uh, work closely together. The second bit is about responsibility. So... That, that, I know that's often termed about having a 
an approach which is beyond profit, but actually we see a responsibility agenda being linked to, to profitable growth. So responsibility around sustainability, around health and how we invest in our people. We've identified a £30 billion prize. So our industry is worth £14.4 billion at the moment. We think we can go more than double it by 2030. Um, that's unapologetically ambitious, I suppose. When you, when you strip it back, it's about 5% year-on-year growth from the kind of 2015 start, starting point to 2030. Uh, and we see that as a statement of our potential, uh, I suppose, as, as much of a target. Um, and it will take a huge amount of investment and collaboration, um, but we've got a pretty good starting point. So that, those are the main features, I suppose, of, of Ambition 2030. Thank you very much. Uh, before any of the members of the committee uh, ask any questions, uh, I'd just like to let you know that there are members of the committee with interests. I, I, for example, would declare an interest that I'm a, a member of a farming partnership. I believe Peter would like to declare an interest. Yeah, thank you, convener. Exactly that. I would like to declare an interest as uh, being in a partner in a farming business as well. And Stuart? registered agricultural holding but derive no income from it okay okay so that's uh, the the interest declared uh, Peter I think you're going to start off on the first theme thank you and good morning gentlemen um, to be honest James you've a answered quite a bit of my initial question in your opening statement but I mean I was just going to ask you to set the scene a wee bit <laughs> and uh, tell us how important food and drink is to the Scottish uh, rural economy and what was the rationale for actually setting up the, the organisation in, in 2007? And following on from that, for maybe the other members of the, the, the panel, you mentioned collaboration as being very important. So I would like to hear how the, the, the range of organisations that are, you know, are, are here today, how, it, how you all fit together in that and how you manage to, to work together to, to achieve the aim. So, you have covered some of that, James, but you know, what was the thinking in 2007 uh, about setting up the organisation in the first place? Yeah, so and how uh, important, as, well, as I say, how important do you, do you feel that uh, food and drink is to the rural economy? Yeah, so you know, our view is that food and drink, farming and fishing will be Scotland's biggest industry by 2030. It's not far off that at the moment. It's our, it's our biggest uh, export, and, and there's new, uh, the first 2017 Q1 export figures have just come out, and we've got you know, the largest food and drink export is Scotch whisky. Our biggest food export alone in the UK is salmon. So it's a huge part of the rural economy, and I suppose you know, similar to tourism, it's one of those industries that stretches into every corner of, of, of Scotland, into some of our most fragile communities. It employs about 119,000 uh, people across Scotland in terms of the, the primary agriculture, fishing and manufacturing sector, and much more when you look right through the supply chain. Um, why did we come together in 2007? Um, I think what, uh, you know, the, certainly for the organisations represented here and the others who are not here today, there's real individual specialisms, but there were a few things that bound us together. So there's a collective desire to grow the value and reputation of Scottish food and drink. Uh, I'm being honest about it, and I speak from, uh, you know, my old... Uh, job. I, I used to do Scott's job at NFU. Um, we were, I was a little bit siloed in how we worked. I rarely spoke to the fishing organisation, despite the fact they had many of the same issues. And the principle of bringing all these organisations together was to, do, to work on the one thing that united us all, which was growing value and reputation. So these individual organisations still exist, but we have a strategic board which brings everyone together. I think that probably the one uh, unique thing, which I know some other sectors are now moving into, was that, we, um, that whilst the creation of Scotland Food and Drink came up came about really in 05, 06 and was launched in 07 under the previous Lib Dem uh, uh, Labour coalition. Um, since 07, mm -hmm. uh, we've developed a real partnership with the public sector, so a deal in a way which is the industry will define the strategy and identify the priorities, but the public sector will then align their investment behind that, both Scottish Government and, the, and their agencies too. Uh, and that's been a real game changer. So mm -hmm. taking exports as an example, we've got a very clear export plan. We've got eight top priority markets and SDI, alongside our funding, now invest their resources um, alongside that. Um, so we think that has worked well, but we can, we can deepen that collaboration, sharing resources, sharing expertise over the next few years. But I'll maybe let others chip in on what they see the, the value of, of mm. this kind of collaborative model. Does, does anyone want to come in? As, as I did say, I mean, it is a large panel, so, so I'll, I'll try and be selective to give you all a chance. Does anyone particularly want to come in on that? Scott, you, you come in, uh, and, that, and then I'll, I'll go to the other end. Uh, 
emphasise what James has said about the export uh, situation, as you probably gathered this morning. We're celebrating good export success uh, first quarter of 2017, <coughs> excuse me, which l puts us on course to be probably by a long chalk, uh, the UK's largest food export, not just Scotland. So um, that is good news. Uh, we have three key uh, areas in, in the world we want to export to, the EU being one, the USA, Canada, the other, and the Far East, the third. Um, and I can tell you that in the first quarter of 2017, the EU's um, uh, volume increased by 11 per cent, the Far East by 24 per cent, but the, by far and away the biggest was North America by 35 per cent, that's for Scottish salmon exports. So that's a key market for us and we, we couldn't do that on our own. We need to collaborate with um, Scotland Food and Drink, with the people who uh, they've appointed, uh, the specialists in the market who are in the US and in Canada. And they've been a great help to us because it's not just about the fact that we, we know we produce a very top quality product, uh, which is good for you, that's another part of the story, but it's also about projecting the image of Scotland, it's about projecting the heritage of Scotland, projecting also the, the qualities of, of the Scottish environment that, that uh, help us to produce this great food. And that's key to the messaging when we go abroad, and if we can do that together in a collaborative way, S Scotland PLC comes out really strongly, and we, and we all tend to... Uh, um, convene, if you like, around various trade shows in the world, and Brussels being the, the most recent one, which is the largest seafood show in the world. We, I was also in Boston earlier this year, and we have a terrific stand now, if any of you ever get the opportunity to come out. And I know Mr. Stevenson, in his previous role as minister, came out to Brussels on a couple of occasions and uh, to see that. And I think um, it's tr tremendous to see how, how well Scotland is projected on the international stage, and the figures st stack that up. They, they support that. Sorry, can I just ask, I mean, I, 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 I too was pleased to see the, the, the increase in, in uh, production. Well, I wasn't quite sure because it was partly, it appeared to me, down to the devaluation of the pound, partly to the increase in value of the product, and partly for difficulties of supply elsewhere in the world. So how, how much has production gone up in the last year? Sorry, that was just yeah, an no, interest. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. Production hasn't really gone up much in the last year, but it's gone up quite a bit in the last quarter. And it's forecast to go up by 20,000 tonnes this, this current year. So we're, we're going to see a, a significant uplift in actual volume this year. But, but the increase has really been, and you're right, uh, you've, you've spotted it, it's in value. It's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily about currency, it's more about, sh it's more about shortage and increasing demand. UNFEO uh, estimate that with, without doing anything, we're going to get an 8% uh, continuing growth in demand just by the dint of the change in demographics of the, of the global population. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a fairly easy one for us to try and fulfill that. The, our biggest challenge is actually getting production up. And, uh, and I know some of you are coming out to visit a farm in the next couple of weeks, and you'll see what the challenges are and how we're trying to overcome that. But it's, it's really about um, value. Value uh, has risen on account of demand fundamentally far outreaches supply uh, around the world. Okay, Sc Scott, I'm going to bring you in, and then I'll come to Stuart, if I may. Scott. Um, thank you. Um, just building on a couple of things that James and Scott, Scott highlighted, and just highlighting two things for us that's particularly important about Scot Scotland food and drink going forward. So one is the competition out there. So if I look at Ireland, for instance, and what they were doing to promote the Irish brand abroad, and what they were doing in terms of pulling their industries together, for us to do nothing wasn't, not, you know, wasn't going to take us forward. So Scotland Food and Drink have to pull things together so that we can compete with, with others. The other, th other main thing I would highlight is about building trust. So the supply chain has lacked trust, particularly from the farming point, point of view. We don't have huge trust in the rest of the supply chain. Working with Scotland Food and Drink, it's about bringing partners together, trying to look at the opportunities and trying to develop some of that trust going, going forward. If I look at farming, past five years, uh, farming comes to fallen by 75%. So we've still got an awful long way to go. So while the food and drink industry is booming in Scotland, that benefit hasn't gone down to the farm level. But in the new strategy, I think that's very much identified as being one of the things that needs to be worked on. And it's not a case of sort of disengaging. <coughs> it's actually about trying to pull everyone closer together, build that trust, see how we can overcome the barriers that currently exist, and how can we capitalise on what fundamentally is a fantastic product range that we have here in Scotland? Okay, Stuart. 
It was just a wee quickie uh, specific thing about Scott Lansborough. Speaking of the substantial success in the last quarter in North America, um, I'm not quite certain, but I believe Canada is probably the fourth biggest salmon producer in the world, or it's, yeah. it's up there anyway. Why are we successful in a market where there's actually quite a strong local producer of a similar product? It's Pacific salmon, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, why are we successful? What, what does that tell us about... Uh, um, well, I think Atlantic salmon, as you know, is a somewhat different species to the, <coughs> to the indigenous salmon that, that they, they produce. Uh, and I think, really, we're targeting the, the high end of the market, the premium end. Uh, and <laughs> fundamentally, it's a better flesh and it's a better flavour. Uh, well, that's, I would say that, I suppose. But um, <coughs> we are targeting white linen cloth, top table Manhattan, uh, San Francisco, Chicago, Miami. But it's not really America. It's four cities. That's how we do it. Uh, and it's very successful. And again, we'll do the same in the Far East. It will be city uh, targeted. And, and we've learned that really through our collaboration with Scotland Food and Drink with the people who are out there in the market actually examining how you drive a marketplace. And it's not about going into a country and spreading yourself thin. It's about deep penetration into very specific markets. And that, that's what we've done successfully. Thank you. Peter, sorry, you, do you want to come back? Mary? Well, I, 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 would, I would particularly like James Graham to, to comment, you know, because James has a, a slightly different perspective from, from the, the rest of the, the panel there in, in that he, you know, represents quite an, a range of cooperatives across Scotland. And um, how, how valuable do you find the, the organisation, James? And, and the, you know, what, what can we do better to, to address Scott's problem of not enough uh, the, the, the success coming back down to the primary producer, which is a huge, huge bit of the, the question that I, I certainly have. Yeah, thanks, Peter. There's, there's potentially a lot of ground to cover there. Mm. Um, Scotland Food and Drink, first of all, I mean, f for us, uh, you know, when Scotland Food and Drink was created, it, you know, it was partly born out of a frustration amongst all of us that actually it was a constraint that we weren't working together. And actually, we were trying to do some of the same things in the same places, but we weren't actually speaking to each other. So simply by bringing it together, you know, we've created something which is much more than the sum of the parts. And I think the results of the last 10 years have proven that time and again. And, um, you know, I still regard this as being in the fairly early stages of what it can achieve. So for me, I think Scotland Food and Drink is, is absolutely essential in terms of aligning policies, aligning resources, and actually enabling us to set some bigger targets and, and go for some bigger things that we would never have dreamt of before. So really important. In terms of collaboration, in another sense, supply chains and, and farmers, uh, I mean, our objectives are, are twofold. You know, we want the most competitive, efficient supply chains, farm to retailer, or whatever the outlet is, or export market. Uh, and that really requires to have the chain working together communicating together, de-risking for each other what, what they're doing in their investment plans. Uh, you know, it requires collaboration. And where there are collaborative chains, it's proven time and again, actually, that they're the most competitive. Uh, and we also have the opportunity for collaboration amongst our businesses uh, horizontally, as Scott has described, to go and uh, pool resources to tackle export markets. Uh, or, or whatever the market is. And, you know, in Scotland, we have a very large SME food and drink sector, and, you know, the opportunities and the gains for them from collaborating, uh, are, you know, are really exponential if we can get them to collaborate a little more. I think the other, the other aspect, with, which is Scott's, uh, you know, been touching on, is we also want, as well as the most efficient supply chains, we want the optimal connection of farming with the rest of the supply chain. And that is suboptimal at the moment in, in many cases. Not every case, uh, you know, but in, some in, but in some cases. And, you know, we want that better connection because we want more certainty for farmers. We want, uh, in, their, in their investment and planning, we want risk reduction for farmers. We want a fairer share of the value of the market for farmers. And all those things cannot be achieved, you know, if, if farmers are isolated from the rest of the chain. And, you know, there's a number of factors in this that I would raise that need, that need to be addressed. I mean, on the practical side, um, the importance of data and digitization to link 
the biological and the physical and the supply chain is greater than ever. That potential is there, but it's on many parts of the chain have a lot of data, but it doesn't speak to each other and it's not joined up. And you know, the management resource in food businesses and in farms to, and the skills to, to take on that job are, are lacking. Um, trust and relationships, we can't do any of that without trust and relationships uh, in the chain. They've got to be present to make a difference. And the third thing I would mention is facilitation because there is a reluctance uh, among some and simply a lack of management capacity among some uh, to actually take on this role of creating a collaboration uh, beyond moving beyond kind of transactional relationships. We need honest brokers to, to, to do some of that task. So I better pause there, but I could go. <laughs> I th I, you can see the passion coming through, but, uh, but I think a pause is maybe the right time just to move on, perhaps to the second theme that we have here, which John Finney's going to, to take on. Uh, thank you, Kinder. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, actually, qu quite a few of the elements have been touched on already. I, I was particularly taken, Mr. Withers, when you talked about a, a model of collaboration and responsible growth, um, and then you used a, a much-used word, uh, sustainability. Can I ask about the relative importance of the, the three markets, so the, the Scottish market, the rest of the UK, and indeed an international market? And I'd be particularly keen to know about efforts to encourage home consumption. So, within, please. so we've obviously touched on exports, but our, you know, <coughs> the, the building block and foundation for that is a, is a strong home market. So, you know, for every one pound we're selling internationally, we're selling two pounds within within the UK. Um, now, those figures are slightly skewed by whisky. Once you take whisky out of the equation and just look at food alone, for every one pound we're selling internationally, we'll be selling four or five pounds uh, in the UK. So, our domestic market in Scotland is critical, and we need to do more there. And, and we're looking in particular how we as an industry tie in much more closely with, with tourism um, and, and ensure that food and drink is a, is a you know, top experience as part of that, that uh, visitor experience to Scotland. Um, and critically then we need more companies doing business elsewhere across the UK, so beyond the Scottish border. You'll see a lot of Scottish companies might be selling into 60 stores in Asda, but they've got the potential to be selling into 600 across, across the UK. Um, and probably in terms of that mix between Scotland and, and UK, just looking at domestic consumption, probably for every one pound of product we sell in Scotland, again, it will be about three or four that goes south of the border into the rest of the UK. So we've deliberately focused on the Scottish market, UK market and international. But it's similar to the point Scott made about salmon going into the US is really a four city approach. That similar level of focus is what we're putting on Scotland, UK and, and international markets. So in UK, actually, there's a specific opportunity in London. Uh, in that, you know, it's obviously the size of population, it's high end markets, premium. There's a very, very good... Uh, perception of Scottish and the quality products in that demographic in London, particularly in the younger element of the population in London. Uh, and in Scotland, it's really about that connection with uh, tourism, our visitor attractions, um, as well as elements of public procurement that we can do more. So, you know, we don't have a large amount of product. That's the one thing we don't have. If you want a mass volume of product, Scotland's not the place to come to. So we need to be really focused in the markets that we want to, want to go to. Okay, thank you. Again, you touched on the, the issue of I mean, I'm just sorry, John, before you go on, does Patrick want to come in on, on that, I mean, on, on the seafood aspect of it? Uh, do, you, do you think there's an element there that to, to help John with his question? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, Scott and, and James have spoken at length about the international um, element and the collaborative working that's going on there, but, but equally there's quite a, a number of collaborative uh, initiatives going on in UK level as well. Um, from a Seafood Scotland perspective, we're working closely with Scotland Food and Drink to target key areas such as such as London and and the, the northern sort of Manchester sort of northern powerhouse um, sort of area as well. We're working with the likes of the craft brewers to try and link um, sort of seafood and beer to key influencers and key buyers and, and their sort of things that are happening in June. Um, and we've also got a local um, advisory service as well called Connect Local, which is linking the local buying opportunities and linking them to local markets. Um, and that's happening on sort of a, a Scotland-wide level too. Yeah, no, th thank you. Um, I, I was going to touch on that because, of course, uh, there's talk of regional showcase events and I understand about wanting uh, growth in other areas, but, you know, maximising local food production and consumption. Can, can anyone comment on these, the regional showcase events, please? Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of one of the things that we've we've... 
we've learned the success of over time. So there's a, there's a big national event that happens now every two years called Showcasing Scotland. So it will happen uh, for two days in October, two or three days in October this year. Uh, and we bring in about 90 buyers from 20 different countries around the world. And we bring in about 50 or 60 buyers from the UK, um, put them together with 120 Scottish companies uh, and over sort of 36 hours of one-to-one -one meet the buyer uh, appointments. We'll do about 30 to 40 million pounds in sales. And again, why have we done that? Because we watched the Irish do it, and they did it really well. Uh, and we've been very blatant in looking at models that exist elsewhere. The New Zealanders have done this kind of model for a while. So we've developed that in, uh, on a national level, both for <coughs> export markets and UK-wide markets. Um, but our view was actually, how do you replicate that in, in local areas? How do you really drive local food networks, regional and islands, food development? So if we had, for example, showcasing highlands, how do we get all the restaurants, top hotels, visitor attractions in a room with key local suppliers and build those and build those connections because what you know in our experience and and connect local would would um i think emphasize this point you often have a lot of local suppliers keen to supply into local outlets a lot local, local outlets that now increasingly get the value of sourcing locally in provenance not enough yet but a growing uh, body that want to do that but actually there needs to be a catalyst to bring them Bring them together. So that's the, the principle that developing these kind of events. We might have showcasing Highlands, Lothians, showcasing West, whatever it might be over the next two years. Do you want to? Yeah, just, just to sort of to, to add to that is that it's not just about bringing the buyers together, that we're, bring, we're building the capacity, we're building the capability of these businesses alongside. So we will run a series of workshops for businesses that are interested in supplying locally to make sure that, the, that they have skills in negotiations and profitability within their businesses as well. Thank you. It, it, it's good to hear, and I think it was Mr. Graham that mentioned small and medium enterprises, because that's you know, the hallmark of Scotland. And I wonder if, for instance, it's often cited that Taste of Arran is an example of, <coughs> excuse me, the manifestation of that. Is, is this the sort of direction? I appreciate there's the higher level of production, but is that a model that you could see replicated elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, I, Taste of Aran is, you know, it's described as Scotland in miniature, and I think, well, Aran's described as Scotland in miniature, and it's probably Scotland Food and Drink principles in miniature too. So they've brought 13 producers together, collectively invested in one MD, uh, who I think is in Thailand at the moment, uh, actually at a show uh, uh, selling uh, Aran products. Um, so that model of, and they've connected tourism very well. If you get the ferry from Ardrossan in the waiting room there, you've got a food and drink story. So they're, they're, they're warming visitors up to it before uh, they land in Brodick. Um, but that, that um, kind of collaborative um, work happening geographically is, rep is, is replicating itself elsewhere. So Shetland are, are starting to develop a stronger profile. There's Taste Orkney, Taste uh, Ayrshire, Taste Persia. I think the other element of collaboration, though, is not geographic, but it's within sectors. So yeah. Patrick <coughs> referred to brewers. So the number of independent brewers has trebled in the last five years. They're now, they're now working collectively. Five years ago, if you'd asked one of them who's the competition, that I said it's that brewer around the corner. Now, actually, they recognise the competition is America, it's Australia. So they're working collectively to raise awareness of, of craft beer from Scotland, which should hopefully you know, be a rising tide that floats all their boats. And we're seeing that in a number of sectors. We've got only really five, six, seven, eight rapeseed oil producers. They're now collectively raising awareness of their product, jointly investing in, in websites, working with chefs. So that kind of um, collaborative ethos has been a total culture change, I think I would say, over the last uh, few years. You know, one thing I would add to that, I mean, there is fantastic potential for so much more of that, but there is another kind of collaboration that you're seeing on the streets now, which is farmers' markets, which, again, weren't there 20 years ago. Um, and that was probably one of the kind of forerunners of uh, SME and local food collaboration and fantastic development. Again, lots more potential if we figure out the best way to develop those farmers' markets. Thank you very much. That's, that's certainly good news. Thank you. To the next, if I may, John. Thanks, convener. Um, yes, there's been a little mention of skills so far, and it was that was the kind of area I wanted to look at, people and skills. So, I mean, apart from selling products and so on, over the last 10 years, what have there been developments or what have the challenges been in that area of having sufficient people, sufficient skills, the right skills, all that kind of thing? And we'll bring David in. Um, uh, Skills is a huge um, uh, challenge for the industry, in common with many under, other industries. Um, 
Um, Skills Development Scotland did a, a, a little bit of work on a skills investment plan um, and they estimated that there's going to be 27,000 job opportunities in food and drink over the next 10 years. So it just shows you that, number one, there are jobs there, uh, but it shows, number two, the, the, the challenges uh, uh, of getting people to, to, to take up those jobs. And that's uh, all types of role from uh, food operators to um, MDs and uh, technical specialists and, uh, and everything in, in between. So it's an enormous challenge. Um, uh, as I said, uh, we launched a skills investment plan with Skills Development Scotland for the food and drink sector in January uh, this year. Um, and so they have a number of initiatives that they're using to uh, um, support trying to fill that gap. Um, we also, in partnership with lots of different organisations, run quite a lot of food education work supported by the, the, the Scottish Government, and that ranges from uh, growing and cooking uh, to the kind of work that my organisation does uh, on careers in the, in the food industry. We, we have a, um, a future in food um, um, uh, careers um, plan that works with local schools um, uh, and connects them with uh, local companies and there are a number of partnerships around Scotland uh, uh, as a result with that. We also um, inspire um, uh, teachers. Uh, we've been done, doing continuous professional development with teachers in geographical areas, uh, currently doing some in, in the west of Scotland. So um, can I just ask, would that be mainly yeah. in rural areas? Uh, no, no, it's all, it's, it's all over Scotland. All over Scotland. All over Scotland. Right. Yep. Um, and just, just the last point on the future in food work is, is also um, we are supporting curriculum development with the uh, Scottish Qualifications Authority, um, developing uh, um, curriculum and exams that people can do all the way from third and fourth year in school all the way up to university level uh, in food science and technology to try and fill some of the skills gap and make a, an easy career progression for people uh, if they want to work in the food industry. Because, I mean, if, if you're talking about doubling your turnover, that is, I mean, you might not need to double the staff, but I mean, across, be it fish, be it brewing, be it food, that is a, potentially a huge number of people. I mean, we've also had kind of a, a bit of a concern with Brexit that we might not be able to pull people in. So wh where are the big concerns going forward? Uh, well, you, you've hit, hit the nail on the head in, in terms of the, the, um, uh, the workforce uh, uh, and Brexit. For us, our number one issue is, is the, the, the status of, of the people who work um, uh, in our food factories uh, across the UK. Yeah. We are going to come on to Brexit. Okay, sorry, so, sorry, yeah, yeah, so, sorry, uh, 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 rather than steal somebody else's thunder, um, we, may, we may store that one up. Okay. Uh, Scott Walker, I think you want to come. Coming back to the people, people and skills, one, one of the things I think is quite interesting just now is in the curriculum for excellence, there's an opportunity in fifth and sixth year to do a low-level apprenticeship scheme. Now, we are working with the Lights of Skills Development Scotland, trying to work with schools to try and give an opportunity for people to get experience of working on farms and working in the rural community. So again, it, it gives people who, who are at school an opportunity to find out what work is like. It hopefully also gives them a showcase into the farming side and then into the food and drinks industry for, further on. And I think that's something that the industry has to talk up more as we go forward. Because traditionally, perhaps, farming, food and drink industry hasn't been the career of choice for many. But when we see the growth that's going to take place in the food and drink industry to show people the range of jobs that are available and how you can start in one place in the industry but move through it throughout your entire career, that's going to be increasingly important. And, and can, do you think you can persuade young people in the cities to think about that if they're not near a farm? And I think it'll be difficult. The logistics are always going to, going to be, be difficult just to get people from, i.e., their home to actually on the farm. But if you go to any city in, in Scotland, just use Edinburgh as an example, there's plenty of farms around, around the edge of Edinburgh. There's plenty of farmers who actually want to work with the, the local schools. It's trying to build those connections. And I suppose coming back to sort of the core ethos of Scotland Food and Drink, it's about trying to break down those barriers and get people working together. So we've not done it in the past, but there's an opportunity to do more of it in the future. I'd like just to bring in the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross, on, on that, if I may, please. Yeah, Scott, I had actually written down a question about developing a young workforce. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about, the foundation apprenticeship side that actually takes the, the young people out of school and, like you say, puts them on a farm or maybe in a kitchen or with a chef in a hotel or, you know, all these kinds of um, opportunities? Because I know we're doing it in the care sector. Is that something that you're actively looking at in the food yes. and drink sector? 
Yeah. Um, I look at it in two, two steps. So you've got foundation apprenticeships, as, as you're talking about there, which is something new. You know, it's, it's, it's something new that's been introduced to the curriculum. It's something new also for farming that we've not, not been involved in. And one of the difficult barriers that, that we have in terms of overcoming is generally farms are small micro businesses. So as a farm, they're not like a big, say, food processor that maybe has an HR department who's well geared up to work with, with the schools. So it's trying to facilitate, trying to work together, say, with groups of farmers to try and show them, you know, that's not as scary as they may think, that there is opportunities. Because probably the first thing that people, people talk about is it's just going to be too difficult. And especially if you don't know anyone who's currently doing it, you don't have any experience to draw on. So we're trying to look in different areas just now if we could get a couple of test pilots up and running. And one good thing about the farming community is it talks. So if we could get up and running successful in one area, people will talk and hopefully we'll see it develop elsewhere. John, you want to come back yeah, with that? A final point was uh, this phrase that's being used, coherent and joined up education programme. Uh, I mean, you talked earlier about selling things together and working together, but I mean, would a career in, say, uh, salmon farming be very different from a career in a brewery? How do, how do you join that up? David, I'll, I'll, I'll let you come in on that. Mm, the answer is yes, uh, um, it can be different, but actually a lot of the skills are transferable. Uh, if you're looking at food science and technology and some of the key skills and uh, and perhaps microbiology or uh, something along those lines, then yes, a lot of it is transferable. And we see uh, in our careers, we see lots of people who've had wide and varied careers in the, in the food industry and hopped from, from different, uh, different um, uh, types of the different sectors. Uh, so absolutely, uh, there's a lot that can be done um, collaboratively. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, the next theme is going to be taken up by Stuart. Uh, just to pick up on what's been said, I'll just give you a brilliant example from my constituency. Billy Gatt's Rockfish Fish and Chip Shop in White Oaks supplies seed potatoes to the primary school that's 300 metres away. They grow them, the potatoes come back to the chip shop, and they're then used to make the fish and chips. And the kids come and visit and see their own products. So sometimes it can be totty wee things that actually just make a wee bit of difference. And in that community, you know, it's terrific. But more substantial things. There's a clear contrast, it strikes me, in supply chain, which I want to talk about, between the ownership structures and integration from salmon farms to plate and to processors and retailers that contrasts quite starkly with what is missing in farming. And in particular, is that absence of a vertically integrated chain broadly, there are examples, why farmers are not getting a fair shout and a fair contribution for their efforts. Whereas I think probably in the generality in salmon farming, a reasonable share of the, the benefits of it is going back to the primary producer. Is that contrast that I'm trying to make a fair one? And if it is, what can we learn across the, the two sides? Perhaps starting with Scott Walker. Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated subject. And I suppose uh, the one, one thing I would highlight is wherever you are in the world, you know, trying to get a good return as a primary producer is difficult. Mm -hmm. So it's not a unique situation that we find ourselves here, here in Scotland. Um, we do have, we don't, well, sorry, we don't have a good tradition of vertical integration in the primary sector here in Scotland, but we do see it developing in some areas. So I would highlight, you know, the pig producers, for, for instance, which again, it was born out of disaster, you know, part, mm -hmm. partly the closure mm -hmm. of the, the main processor in Scotland. But from that then came an initiative where the pig producers in Scotland worked with an over, overseas seas company in terms of an abattoir and breaking, and they now have more ownership of, of that, that production line and in terms of the product going, going, going to the market going forward. And as an industry that's been contracting for many years, it's now an industry that's actually in expansion. You know, they're looking for new pig producers to come in to increase production, production over, 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 over time. And I know James Graham through SUS have been, has been heavily involved in facilitating that, making, making that, that a re reality. And I think that's the success story that, that we, can, we can build build upon. 
If I do that at one side and go to, say, the complete different end of the industry, I'd look at the livestock side, the cattle and sheep industry in, in Scotland, which is by far the biggest part of agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. is you know, roughly three out of every farms are involved in, in that, that, that sector. And vertical integration is not something that's common there, there, there at all. The, the difficulty is how do we actually move that forward? You know, how do we get a situation where a farmer can work hand in hand with a processor, can identify a market, and perhaps ultimately, you know, the, the best scenario for me would be the farmer would hold, hold that contract. So the farmer would actually hold, say, that export contract to, to a different country, and he'd get a contract killed, killed on, and he would be exporting the, the pro product abroad. I've sort of made the proposition that that vertical integration would be good and helpful. Could you just directly say whether you think it would be? Because while it might work for salmon, it would, th I, would it be helpful? I, I think the principle, yes, but you couldn't say it would be, it's a solution in every case. No, because simply no, through no. vertical integration, there isn't a guarantee there'd be a better return but I think it would be a good step forward for most well, parts of the industry. Well, let me just take that on further then. Um, given that we're in Parliament and we are parliamentarians, are there inhibitions or difficulties that the government and we as parliamentarians should be engaging with to break down barriers to be more successful top to bottom of the industry? You know, what, um, what, what are we doing to stop you doing it that we should stop doing? I'd like to bring Scott in, then I'd like to go to the other end of the table to, to, to bring the other Scott in, just because, I mean, it's obviously something that maybe mm -hmm. they do yeah, in their yes, industry. Yes. So, Scott, if you'd like to carry on, and then I, if I could bring you uh, in. No, Scott Walker first. Uh, I'll be very, very brief, just two, two things I, I would highlight. I would think more could be done to uh, encourage producer organisations. So to get groups of farmers working collectively to, together so that they would have the power to negotiate the contracts elsewhere in the supply chain. You know, not, not enough has been, has been done, done there. So that's, that's the first, first thing. And then the second thing would be about trying to help investment and processing capacity. So two things the government could do in terms of investment and processing capacity. So where there's a grant scheme just now to invest in processing, I think there should be conditions on when that grant's paid to look at more collaborative models where mm. they're working closer with, with farmers, farmers themselves is one thing. And secondly, when you are looking at increasing processing, if, if there could be greater emphasis placed on looking at farmer co cooperation. So we've had stuff in the cereal sector in recent years, for instance, investment up in, up in Montrose, which was in essence farmer-based. Farmer mm. So we're coming from a very you know, small scale level just now, we've got a long way to ca catch up, but targeting in certain ways, I think could help make those, those loops and bounds. Scott, I mean, from, from some producers, it seems to be more vertical integration. Do you want to add to that? To that? Um, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, um, uh, taken by some of the things Scott has just said, I think his suggestion that more producer organisations is, is, is a good idea. I really support that, that, that premise. I think that, that would be important. But I don't know enough about his sector to, to comment any further than that. But I will pick up on a couple of things he said uh, in, with regard to the pig farmers born out of disaster, consolidation and contraction. That's the history of Scottish salmon farming, fundamentally. And that's 17 years ago now. Uh, born out of disaster at that time, uh, significant consolidation. And I'm talking about horizontal as opposed to the vertical integration at that time, to the extent that now we really only have uh, seven salmon farming companies of real scale in Scotland. Two are indigenous Scottish companies. So uh, as much as it works very efficiently and there's a vertical integration that gives undoubtedly a return to the primary producer, uh, and, and we've got great examples of, of the whole, the vertical integration right to retail. I mean, it, you know, one of our high street retailers really um, it sets the product specification for the primary and the secondary pr producer before it hits the shelf, and inc that includes the packaging, what's put, put in the label. So it's completely uh, vertical, complete vertical integration in that example, which is very successful. But you know, the, the other side of this is, as if you like, we're sitting in the Scottish Parliament here. A lot of that's uh, inward investment from abroad. Um, 
you know, so uh, do we have the capacity to, uh, for, for a start, do we have the appetite for the risk? Because there's a significant amount of risk when you go into uh, large-scale primary production. Uh, and that was the, the cause of the consolidation uh, 17 years ago in Scotland, salmon farming. So I mean, to, to establish an average size salmon farm in Scotland now, you need uh, you won't get any change out of four million pounds. That'll take you at least two and a half years to get a return on that. Um, you know, it's uh, quite a challenge. Um, and I, th you know, if asking what could parliamentarians do to help? Well, we, we, we're already talking to uh, the, the um, through Marine Scotland to the planning minister about you know, speeding up the planning process. That's one of the things that can, that would help in primary production for us. Um, but we're a model that works. Is it the model that you would really like to transfer completely over to the um, arable and pastoral section? Yeah, Who wants to come in? Yeah, I mean, I think my kind of, you know, initial answer to Stuart would be on vertical integration is it's, it's desirable but not essential. And I think you also have to think about where you start from. Uh, if you look around Europe, in fact, if you look around the world, vertically integrated pharma co-ops is, is a norm. Uh, model in many, many countries, particularly in dairy. Um, and on mainland Europe, it's, it's, a, it's a normal model. But when you actually examine how they've created those things and how, whether we could replicate that today in the UK, you know, the answer seems to be that the best, uh, the best way to have done that was to start 100 years ago and have 100 years' worth of accumulated capital. And then, in, of course, in the middle of the last century, we uh, had statutory marketing boards in the UK which removed the need for farmers to make the investment uh, themselves. And so we kind of, we're in a, a catch-up place now, trying to catch up with what others have done. And the, and the question arises is, can we actually come up with the capital to compete with some of those businesses that have been around for 100 years? I was a director of a co-op, an non-executive director of a co-op that was vertically integrated in Scotland. And they ultimately sold the business because they simply couldn't keep pace with the capital requirement for secondary value-added processing. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common problem. There are quite a number of co-ops involved in primary processing, bringing the farm product together, doing the initial work on it, and then selling it on to the next guy in the chain. And it's that next step in the chain, that secondary processing, which is really capital-intensive. Uh, and it never ends, you know, the capital, in, the capital requirement continues. So you see in Ireland where the dairy co-ops, you know, uh, one of the big dairy co-ops actually separated its primary processing from its secondary processing. The secondary processing became a PLC because it's much higher risk and much higher capital investment and the primary processing stayed in the co-op with the co-op owning some of the shares in the PLC. So it, it's back to Scott's point, it's complex, you know, it's complex. James, and do you, do, you, do you, well, perhaps you could ask it now, and then maybe James could answer that as part. James Withers could answer that as part of the. Well, my, my final question is probably directed at Patrick, um, supply chain, where we've got an odd situation in seafood where we don't have enough of the stuff that we catch landed to supply our processors, and we're importing lots of other people's, and. Is that, on both sides of the equation, an opportunity lost for us? Um, now, the catchers at present, not always been the case, are actually doing extremely well. The processors are finding life harder. So the problem is in a different bit of the chain in, in that. Is that. And again, the question is, you know, we as parliamentarians and as government, what can we do to help? Uh, and finally, I'll just say, by the way, just on Irish, 30 years ago, my wife always bought Kerrygold butter. She now buys Graham's. I wonder yeah. why. <laughs> but you'd come in maybe not on this one, maybe on another question which you can build it in, but that was particularly at Patrick. So, Patrick, if you'd like to answer that. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you are right in what, what you say. And if we had five, six years ago, we could have flipped that equation mm. and said that the, the catching sector were suffering quite badly. The mm. processors would have been, um, would have been quite... quite um, favourable for those situations. Um, there, there are potential issues that processors at the moment are facing. Um, uh, James and, and everybody else has, has alluded to the fact that investment is, is difficult whenever capital investment is difficult when you get to a business of scale. Um, so um, grant um, uh, 
schemes such as EMFF are maybe excluded or from, from businesses of scale. Businesses are suffering from um, rates as well at the moment as well. So there are issues that are particularly impacting on processors. But yeah, we need to try in some form and get to this equilibrium where we actually have a fair return back to the catching sector, but we have the processes that are able to um, purchase fish from, from local markets as well. Do forgive me, you're describing the problem. Do you have solutions that you'd like to put to us? Um, at the moment, that, that's what we're trying to work up. Um, we're looking at um, the Ambition 2030 strategy. We're looking at the aquaculture strategy as, uh, strategy as well and seeing where the seafood sector fits in there and actually come up with a strategy of our own. But we're out of consultation at the moment and we're engaging with all the key sectors to try and move that forward. Okay, we're going to move on to the next theme, if we may, which is uh, Jamie Green. Thank you. Um, before we continue, may I just ask a question um, to uh, David Thompson? Um, uh, can you just explain what the uh, Food and Drink Federation Scotland is and how that relates to Scotland Food and Drink? Okay, yeah. Um, sorry, we're on. Um, uh, we, uh, I'm uh, part of the Food and Drink Federation Scotland, so I'm the chief exec in Scotland and we have a Scottish board, but we're a part of a UK organisation, uh, FDF. Uh, which is the biggest trade association for food and drink in the UK, um, uh, or Great Britain, sorry. Um, uh, um, but in Scotland, we have um, a, a Scottish team and a Scottish board, so we're, we, we have autonomy within that, within that structure. Uh, we are a trade association, a membership association of food and drink manufacturers. Um, and uh, we are um, a fully paid up member, have been uh, um, since day one of uh, Scotland Food and Drink. Um, and I sit on the uh, executive board like my colleagues here. Um, uh, and so our members are, uh, some are the same uh, as with James and some other organisations, and some are UK um, uh, companies who manufacture in Scotland. Um, for example, uh, Nestle uh, would be one of those examples who are um, members of ours and, and also manufacture in Scotland. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, so one of the uh, key pillars of the 2030 strategy is around innovation. I wonder if we could delve into that a little bit more. And there are a lot of words used in the uh, document, such as collaboration, raising the profile, uh, single gateway, etc. I, I, in many ways, these are often perceived to be quite jargony. So I wondered if you might actually put some examples to what you're doing to drive forward innovation. I'll touch on that to start with. Uh, and the danger is you end up with yeah, sort of jargon bingo in the document uh, has, has a bit of that going on, which I, I would accept. One example of what can happen in innovation, um, you know, innovation in many ways is the, is the ballgame for us. What, what's happening in terms of the food and drink market, consumer uh, appetites, how people like to buy, uh, the kind of global population stuff is changing at such a rapid pace that we need to evolve with that. One example of the kind of thing we're doing, um, if you look back about a year ago, and if you were a food and drink company, uh, or indeed a farmer looking for support to innovate, whether that's innovate in types of products, your staff, your processes. There was about 150 different support tools that existed in Scotland that you could tap into between various different agencies. Um, so most people look at that and go, well, that's just a maze. I'll never navigate that. I'll go back to the day job. And innovation becomes a thing that they'll look at down the line. Um, there's a new service that, that uh, we're just launching uh, that uh, we've been involved in, in as a Scotland Food and Drink project called Making Innovation Happen. One number, one website. If you want, to, if any part of innovation you're interested in, start there and you'll be guided through that process. Um, and that's quite a good snapshot of what's happened in, the, in, in our world over the last 10 years. 10 years ago, um, not much was happening. Uh, and most companies said there's not enough happening in, in food and drink in Scotland. Often the criticism you hear now is there's so much going on in Food and Drink Scotland, it's really, it's really difficult to navigate around that. So a key part of what we need to do is to streamline that, that landscape. So making innovation happen is one example of where we'll pull the various different support tools into one place, single gateway. So companies, whether they're at the farm gate, fishing boat, manufacturing, factory floor, um, have one place to go to try and steer through that, uh, what was previously um, a maze. Beyond that, um, the big uh, priority is to get more and more, I think, food and drink companies to consider uh, academic and research solutions to their problems and to get more and more research and academics of thinking of applying their solutions to the food and drink industry. So the work of the likes of Interface to bridge business and, and academia together because we're blessed with, you know, world-leading institutes that we probably haven't taken the most uh, advantage of. 
So a lot of the uh, success of the last uh, decade has been uh, new, new emergence of new industry and new products. So for example, the, the, you mentioned the draft, uh, the sort of craft beer and, and gin distilleries, for example. Uh, where do you see the opportunities lie in terms of potential for new product areas that Scotland could uh, expand on based on, for example, our resource, climate, skill expertise, etc. Are there any uh, uh, fledgling uh, food and drink industries that you think will boom over the next 10 to 15 years? Uh, uh, sorry. It, 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 just to remind you, if you want to come in to catch my eye, James is very quick at catching my <laughs> sorry. eye. And, sorry. And, and, and launching straight away before, before I can get to anyone else. So if anyone else does want to come in, please let me know. Sorry, James. Okay, apologies. I'll restrain myself. Um, <laughs> I think there's a th so we, part of what led to Ambition 2030 was about a year's worth of research. Um, and Scotland's strength, which is quite unusual for a small country, is the diversity of products we have. So if you look at Norway, it's a seafood world. Um, if you, you know, look at Denmark, I suppose it's intensive livestock. You look at New Zealand, dairy is very strong, lamb is very strong. Whereas actually we've got an incredible uh, range of products, which is our strength. So our view is not to back one horse or the other, but there's a few trends that we see there happening. So the health trend, for example, um, that desire, people are thinking harder about their food choices, where their food comes from, and the whole debate around diet and nutrition. Now, Scotland, you know, paradoxically, despite our challenges domestically with, with diet and health, has one of the healthiest natural larders in the world, from cereals to lean red meat to soft fruit and vegetables. So there's a real opportunity in tapping into that trend and selling that, that health message. The other trend, which is a gift to Scotland, um, is this, you know, interest in provenance and where food comes from. Now that means different things to different people. So in, in China, the only thing they want to talk to about is food safety. Just tell us about safety controls. In Japan, they take food safety for granted, but they want to talk about environmental controls. In the US, they like the heritage story and the expat story and the, and the history around it. So it's, it's kind of different things in, in different markets, but it's more about fixing on those particular trends, which are actually relevant whether you're a craft brewer a uh, seaweed manufacturer or you know mainstream livestock or, or, or fish producer and using those trends to to, to drive growth because we know that they are kind of here to stay um, having said that everyone then put their hands up which may have been a dangerous <laughs> thing to say i'm going to start with scott james and then david if, if, if i could ask you to keep them succinct that'd be great okay, thanks uh, in the agriculture, salmon agriculture industry, innovation is now a high priority. Um, Scottish Agriculture Innovation Centre was established three years ago now uh, with funding from the Higher Council, uh, Higher Funding Council. Um, the Scottish Government backed that, and for every pound that's been invested uh, from, of public money, th uh, three pounds has come back from the industry. So it, it's 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 been a it's been a worthwhile, I think. Um, return for the public money in that and, and what's it achieved well <coughs> the, the, the priorities of, and it's well documented I'm sure you read it in your Sunday newspapers we have a risk and impact of biological threats that's another name for sea lice um, we are looking to move into new production models more exposed sites um, more onshore super smolt production to give the salmon shorter time at sea in other words to shorten the, the exposure to lice uh, and we're investing Last year, we invested £55 million in new non-medicinal approaches to sea lice management. So we're taking this problem seriously, and we expect to uh, start um, rolling out some serious innovation in, in the design and, and uh, development of our, of our new, new sites. Uh, and uh, the spin-off from that, we think, is commercialisation of Scottish innovation as well, that we can actually export the Scottish know-how. We've got a um, world-class facility at Stirling University, the Institute of Aquaculture there, and we're already exporting our know-how around, around the world, and we'll see that increasing over the next few years. Um, I'm going to come back to the primary and the primary connection to the supply chain, because uh, we, you know, the need for innovation in both those areas we've kind of talked about. And, I mean, the point is, incentivize the behaviours we wish to see. And what I'm referring to is innovation combined with collaboration. And there are a couple of precedents where that has actually happened. The EU fruit and veg regime, for instance, provided um, and still provides a grant towards innovation programs that recognised producer organisations can implement. 
And that grant has effectively transformed Scotland's fruit sector into a superstar sector. We have a, something similar, uh, although not, not nearly equivalent to that. We have a Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund grant scheme, which is available to, uh, to all farmers um, and is now beginning to address some of the difficulties that we have in the chain, like seasonality in lamb and supplying lamb year-round to, to supermarkets, looking at how we apply lean management techniques into dairy farming, a number of those things. But we don't have this general incentivization available across all sectors at anything like a meaningful level. So my answer would be incentivize the behaviors we want to see, support and focus assistance on collaboration with innovation. Let me give you the last chance on this topic. Two, two things on innovation. The first is the, the service that James mentioned, Make Innovation Happen. Um, uh, just to, to highlight the fact that it's not just about new product development, it's also around processes, it can go into HR, it can go into anything. So it's a, an important tool uh, for businesses to use. And then the second thing is just to highlight the wealth of um, academic expertise that we have in Scotland. I was at the launch yesterday of the new Food Science and Technology Labs at Aberdeen University, a fantastic facility. 3.6 million pounds investment in trying to provide great uh, facilities not just for students but also for businesses to, to make use of similar facilities um, uh, at the new Rowett Institute in Aberdeen similar facilities in Queen Margaret University and in other places so there's actually a huge amount of investment in, uh, in, in this area um, uh, by the public sector um, We're now going to come back to a subject which some of you touched on earlier Mike <clears throat> Brexit and uncertainty. Um, we're leaving the EU. We could also be leaving the single market and the customs union. We could have trade barriers for our food exports. And I don't mean just tariff barriers. I mean actual delays at customs, physical delays in exporting our food uh, <coughs> and our exports to Europe. So how are you gauging and how are you dealing with the risks to our food and drink exports to Europe? Um, I think this goes across, I think, if I may start with James and sort of Patrick and, and, and Scott, I think, will, will, will want to contribute. So if we start with James. Um, okay, thank you. I, I suppose to put the issue in perspective might be helpful for, at the start, at least helps me get around, my head around the, the subject. Last year we sold £5.5 billion pounds of uh, mm. food beyond the UK. 40% mm. of that went to the EU. Um, now, four billion out of that five and a half is whiskey, so put that to one side. Of the 1.5 billion we did in food, 70% went to the EU. Um, so it is absolutely a critical market for us. Um, and from a trade point of view, no deal is a bad deal, um, in part because of all the 5,200 WTO tariffs are, food gets hit the worst. A big variety, I think, in, in Scott Landsborough's sector, it's maybe 2% on fresh salmon tariff and 13% on smoke, but if one of our other partners called to me, Scotland, were here, they would tell you the price of Scotch beef, if it defaulted those tariffs would go from an increase of somewhere between 50% and 100%. So growth wouldn't be the debate, it would be hanging on to what we've got, which I think would be very difficult. How do we, how do we tackle that? One is ensuring that food and drinks recognise as a priority. Um, I hear a lot of talk of aviation and automotive. Well, food and drink manufacturing is worth more than both of them combined in, in, in the UK. So we need to make absolutely sure that trade deals with Europe are priorities and that third country trade deals beyond Europe, food doesn't become a bargaining chip that, that we hand away. Because most other countries that I've seen in terms of trade deals they want with the UK want access to the UK for their people. And I think that will be a challenging debate given immigration has driven it and they want access for their food. Um, so, so we need to be mindful of that. How do we address that? A lot of that is out with our control beyond just making the point that, that farming, fish and food and drink has to be prioritised in Brexit negotiations and third party trade deals. Um, we need to be better at spreading our markets and risk management. So um, there's a reason that Brexit is probably least scary for the whisky industry. They're still concerned. And that's because, for a start, they're not going to have a tariff, but they're also dealing with another 100 and 80 countries around the world. We've got too much business in too few hands. So Scott, um, Scott Lansborough mentioned the kind of export profile. We've now got 11 trade staff in 11 cities around the world, jointly funded by SDI government and, and by industry. Uh, eight of them are in cities beyond Europe. We need to do more trade there because there will always be 
political barriers, whether it's Russian import embargoes, whether it's a change in Chinese regulations, whether it's Brexit, another Eurozone crisis. And we need to make each of those crises a little less scary than they are by spreading our markets. So investing in, in markets elsewhere um, uh, uh, is critical to managing that risk. But certainly in terms of you know, the actual Brexit negotiations, having food and drink at the top of the priority list and recognising that for us it's going to be all about trade, access to skilled labour and the future of funding, particularly at primary level as well as manufacturing. Patrick. Yeah, I would agree with, with everything that James has said. And we, we have already seen from an industry point of view that we've got a lot of businesses that are basically taking notice and actually trying to spread the, spread the market risk, looking at new markets out with Europe as well, not underestimating the importance of the European market to, to these businesses at any point. Scott, do you want to come in on that? Um, yeah, we, we, we export a perishable product. Yes. You know, it's got a short life. So uh, for us, uh, and James mentioned the potential financial tariffs we would incur if we had a, a WTO relationship. Believe it or not, that's not such a significant concern. Our concern is frictionless non-financial tariff barriers. In other words, pieces of paper, consignment. We've just gone through an exercise with the Chinese authorities, and as James said earlier, uh, the Chinese are paranoid about food safety for historical reasons. And uh, we are now, we are now uh, getting electronic consignment sig signatures uh, within Scotland, although it's been a bit of a resource issue by the local authorities, but they've resolved it now. So we can get our salmon into the Chinese market within 48 hours. We need to do that. If, we, if we're going to, if the European Union is 39% of our export market, and so if we can get to Manhattan in 24 hours, surely we can we can be in Paris and under that. And uh, we won't be if we've got tariff barriers that are uh, demanding the lorries are stopped at the seaport or at the airport or whatever to pass bits of paper. The EU uh, currently the single market ensures that, or, or the customs union ensures that doesn't happen. So we want that to continue. Scott wants to come in, but Mike, do you have a follow-up on that, or should we take Scott now? No, please do take Scott. Yeah, it, it's worth starting off just by saying from the primary producers' end, um, initially, Brexit's been positive because the pound's weakened. So it's, it's made the imports more expensive and made our, our exports more, more attractive. So at this point in time, there's been, been a lift in, in primary, primary production. The impact then is very different for the different sectors. And I'll just highlight two and then say something that I think we could do in short term uh, to, to deal with some of the volatility. So if you look at the beef sector, uh, for, for instance, roughly we export as much as we import in the UK, UK as a whole. So if we can't export to Europe because the tariffs are put in place, as long as we put the same tariffs in place here in the UK, then for our beef sector, you might say the situation will be neutral to positive. But that's reliant upon it not just being a one-way trade deal. So we may not be able to export to Europe, but the UK government can't open up our doors and just allow food to flow, flow, in, he, flow in here. So that's if you're a beef farmer. So beef farmers looking ahead, it's, it's all about what's the UK government going to do about tariffs in this, this country. If you're a sheep farmer, though, though the situation's a disaster an absolute disaster for a sheep farmer going forward. You know, 60% goes to, to Europe, you know, pr pr approximately. If tariffs go up in, up in Europe, then there's no other markets that we'll realize overnight. And for the sheep industry, prices will plummet. So that's, that's just to highlight the difference in, in the different sectors. Short term, what can we do to mitigate some of those, those factors? It's about investing in the Scottish market and the UK market, you know, trying to drive more home consumption of, of product to sort of deal with that vol, vol, volatility. So at least here, we're sort of stoking up and maximizing the opportunity to sell products here, here in the UK. Long term, as the other speakers have, have said, we've got to, to guard against um, agriculture, food, not being one of the big bargaining chips in terms of doing, doing trade, trade deals, deals abroad. So not just in terms of Europe getting a deal, say, for financial services quickly and selling agriculture, food down, down the line, but also in terms of when the UK looks around the world and they'll look at, right, what deals are we going to do? 
We've got a fantastic industry here. We've got one that stretches to every corner of, of Scotland. We've also got one, I think, that, that people don't necessarily totally appreciate. They don't, don't see it. And if we sell ourselves short here, we're going to sell, sell off one of the big wealth generators of Scotland, one of the big job creators of Scotland of the future. Uh, I'm going to bring Peter in, if I may, with a, with a brief follow-up and then back to my... Yeah, well, I, I mean, uh, one thing I would say to Scott Lansborough, I mean, my opinion would be, and you'll know the market better than me, but my opinion would be if we can sell, you know, salmon and get it into the American market in 24 hours and we can sell salmon in the Chinese market, I wouldn't be too scared about selling into the, the European market. That would just be a comment. Another thing I would say is, as far as getting food and drink as a priority to get, to get tariff-free trade, one of our best uh, uh, allies in that is, is the Southern Irish, because they are desperate for free trade into our marketplace. You know, and so they're, they're batting in exactly the same court as we are to get free trade across Europe. You know, their, their agricultural industry would be decimated if our, if, our, if our marketplace was made much more difficult for them to, import, to export into our, our market. So it's just a comment that, you know, there are, there are allies out there that, that, that are looking for the same sort of deal as we are. Mike, do you have a, a brief question? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, so can I just follow up what's being said? So basically, I Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're all agreement that, that we need a trade deal. And when we're looking at trade deals, it's about getting a trade deal within, a, within the agricultural sector rather than trading it off against something else, like the fishing industry. You know, we were talking about a, a trade deal within the fishing industry rather than trading that against some other trade deal with manufacturing or, or whatever. Have I, have I, am I summarising that correctly? Um. Scott, if you want to answer for the group, you may. I would ask you to keep it brief. Uh, yes, that's, that's a big concern. Uh, for the UK as a whole, food and farming is seen as less valuable than some mm -hmm. other sectors, mm -hmm. so we get traded away at the expense of the benefit of other sectors. Okay. okay. We're going to move on to the next theme, if I may, which is Jamie Green. Thank you, convener. Um, uh, two short questions. The first... Uh, is, uh, on, on the, uh, in your opinion, to anyone in the panel, is the current digital infrastructure in Scotland sufficient to uh, help the food and drink industry meet its ambitions and strategy, uh, or at least is it heading in the right direction? Uh, that's the first question. And could I ask one person to answer that? So I don't know who, who would like to take on broadband. Um, you're all ducking. Um, <laughs> Uh, Scott, why don't you, you try uh, that, and, and we'll let you, James, fair. come in on the second one. It, it's very poor. You know, in, in certain areas of Scotland, it's still up, not up to, to scratch. The cost for, whether it be a farm or small-scale producer, to put in the necessary broadband capacity that they need is just prohibitive at this, this point in time. Is, are things improving? Yes, they are improving, but they're not improving fast enough. Jamie, do you want to ask us the second Yeah, that, that's, thanks for that um, simple reply. Uh, the next one was, is on a more positive note, is around the possibilities for use of technology uh, in general. So, for example, there was talk about an e-commerce platform. Uh, James, you also mentioned about data sharing amongst uh, the supply chain to help improve efficiencies and improve productivity. Does anyone have any views on uh, how... Uh, this platform might work in practice? It sounds like an interesting, but quite a, a big ambition or project to implement. James, it looks like you're, you, if you could answer that. Uh, yeah, I think um, I mean, a large part of the success of e-commerce in Scotland will be back to your first question about um, digital coverage. And, and just to add to Scott, for me, I think the mobile connectivity uh, telecommunication is as important as the broadband uh, broadband piece, although I appreciate telecommunication, I think, is, is a reserve matter. Um, so, yeah, e-commerce, you know, clearly the amount of business that is, um, you know, being transacted online is huge and is growing, uh, and I think Scotland might be a little bit behind the pace compared to, to other countries. Um, at the moment, what that looks like in a food and drink um, context is, you know, we've done work with Amazon, for example, that are interested in... Uh, in and looking at what a Scottish shop online might look like. Um, but the, those existing third-party platforms take huge margins out of the chain in, in product areas like 
seafood, I suppose, where there aren't huge margins to, to be taken. Um, no country in the world has a national uh, e-commerce platform for the food and drink industry. Is that something we could look at? Could Scotland be the first there? Um, now, a large part of that is about building the e-commerce capability of individual businesses uh, and building that connectivity piece. So it's, it's a big, um, I suppose that kind of thing would be a big aspiration. And there's some discussion happening now. There's an e-commerce action group that's coming together. Uh, SE, uh, Scottish Enterprise HIE are involved as well about how we build that capability of, of companies to tap into that. But, you know, m my aspiration would be um, you know, Scott talked about the Brussels Seafood Show. I mentioned the one in Thailand that's happening just now. There's 10 companies there. I would like on an iPad the remaining 850 companies to be there that you can trade with. Uh, other countries are looking at that. I don't think that should be an aspiration. We, we, we should uh, necessarily think is, is, is beyond us, but, it's, but there's a huge amount of investment in capability and awareness to, required to, to do that. Thank you. We um, have quite a few themes still to get through, and uh, we're coming quite close to the time that we'd allocated to this. So I, I don't want to lose any of this because I think it, it's very important, but I would ask members if they could try and limit their questions on, on each of the themes. And if you could look within your group to find the most appropriate person to answer, it would help. And, and without uh, curtailing Richard, your, yours is the next theme. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Scotland's food is fantastic. Salmon, fantastic. But basically, Scotland's health is a worry. We, we can expect to see 40% of us being obese by 2030. Obesity be, uh, is, is not just a health issue, it's a major risk uh, to a productive economy. So what would you suggest anyone uh, as a strategy, as a strategy supporting public health and tack tackling obesity? Is it right? Can it be amended? I'll shorten these questions down. Where do you think we should target? David, you... you. Yes. Um, so, yes, uh, obesity is a major problem in Scotland and, a, and an increasing one, not just in Scotland, but across all of Western Europe. Um, I think the second thing to say is that there's a lot of work going on in the food industry um, to support reducing calories, reducing sugar, um, uh, um, at the moment as we stand um, uh, also uh, the public are changing uh, um, what they're buying so now um, more um, low or uh, no uh, calorie uh, soft drinks are being drunk than, than full sugar so things are changing in, in a very positive uh, direction so that, that, that's part one but there's a still an enormous amount to do and the food industry needs to play its part in that um, in terms of the strategy, uh, the strategy is very clear, as, 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 as I hope James has uh, highlighted earlier, around uh, responsibility. And that responsibility includes to the health of the people who work in the industry and also to the health of the nation. Um, and I think what um, collectively we're uh, very up for is, is uh, you know, um, a clear compact with, with um, government and others on what the best things uh, um, to do for the industry are. And that means, uh, should support be angled slightly differently? Um, uh, and it means that, um, you know, the industry will have to play its part in, in um, helping uh, uh, do what it can. What I would say is um, uh, the um, reformulation targets that were set at a UK level are having a significant effect uh, on uh, categories in the industry, and some of those um, will be met, others will be more difficult to meet. Um, and what we don't want uh, to happen is that um, small and medium-sized enterprises in Scotland miss out because they don't have the ability to reformulate, they don't have the technical skills or the consumer analysis or things like that. So we are working very closely with the Scottish Government to see how we can support companies in Scotland to actually reduce um, their calories, reduce their sugar, reduce their portion size in a way that um, consumers will still want to buy them. Thank you. Gail, the next theme is yours. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking all morning about how to formulate these questions, and I think probably the best way is just to be quite direct about it. Um, I was at an event last night um, about sustainable food systems and the environment, and uh, Tim Benton from the University of Leeds in Chatham House was, was very specific about climate change and the increase in... Um, global temperatures and, and what that would mean to obviously our food producing systems. Um, if we're going to be doubling our turnover in the years up until 2030, how does that impact on the environment and why is there not more um, focus on climate change in the strategy? James. 
So sustainability is a key part of the responsibility piece, and um, sustainability hits a sweet spot where you know it's essential for the future um, ability of us to produce food here, but it's also actually part of the brand and it's a selling piece as well. Um, my view on this, um, and I'll use beef in, as an example, because you'll hear uh, a lot of people saying that um, beef production is an environmental car crash. The amount of water it uses, you're feeding edible human grain into the mouths of, of cattle that could be, and we've got a, you know, a billion people that are malnourished in the world. How, um, how environmentally sustainable is that? My view is if you're going to do beef production, come and do it in Scotland. We're not short of water and we're very good at growing grass, which we can't eat and turn that into protein. So I think that's where Scotland's place within that sustainability um, agenda um, is very strong. That said, there is more we need to be doing. So we could definitely, we can be more efficient in our use of resources. Now, a lot of that's been driven by the fact these resources are getting more expensive anyway, so, so why wouldn't we do that? Um, but there is more that can be done around sustainability and we're keen to commit to, to making a contribution uh, on that front. But I think Scotland does have a, a strong advantage and salmon would be a great example. You know, the world needs sustainable protein. Um, and I think it was 2015 was the first year that more farmed fish were eaten than wild caught fish globally. Um, and that's one of the few areas actually where Scotland can be a world leader. I mean, we're the third largest producer, but actually we've been going backwards in terms of market share, but we could be a real world leader. There are biological challenges for sure, um, but there's a real potential to invest in that in Scotland. So um, sustainability is, is, to us is critical, and actually I think Scotland can um, overplay its hand on that. Uh, Scott, on the back of uh, James, kind of give me an introduction there. Uh, we, we are fully aware of the climate change going on in, in salmon farming just now. Uh, just to give you an example, the algae uh, that was, was and used to be indigenous to our waters is now off Greenland, and the uh, and algae we now experience is tropical. And that's actually not conducive to healthy fish, be they wild, be they farmed in Scottish waters. And we've had a lot of challenges, gill health challenges over the last four to five years that have been really kind of sh shrouded, if you like, by uh, the story about sea lice. And that's again another reason, um, that, that's a consequence of, of climate change and warmer, warmer waters. I just read this morning on the wires that uh, sea lice numbers in Iceland are now at a record high and that's they're putting it all down to um, the, the sea temperature rising by one degree. So we're facing these challenges now um, and we're, you know, we're spending, spending an inordinate amount of money trying to deal with them. It's, it's, it's not easy and it won't be solved overnight. <clears throat> but but the, the, the potential we have in the world market, and I think we've alluded to it uh, already from a healthy food perspective, if you have two pieces of oily fish, uh, per week, that'll give you your omega-3 requirement. Um, it, you know, there lo lots of great uh, positions there for, from a healthy food perspective. Also from a, an environmental sustainability, uh, water usage to produce a kilo of salmon is remarkably small compared to other proteins. Our carbon footprint is remarkably small. Our physical footprint, if you, add a, if you take all the salmon farms in Scotland and add them all together, you get three golf courses. That's the physical footprint of salmon farms in Scotland. It's not very much, considering it's now worth uh, six, you know, let me get this right now, about you know, 680 million pounds in exports to the country. So you know, there, there are lots of good sustainable things there, but the, but the biological, the, the whole climate change thing for us is biological challenge. The, the marine waters in Scotland are changing and that's giving us biological challenges. As a consequence, we're going to be developing all sorts of different styles of farming, uh, probably going more offshore, but also doing some enclosures as well in, in the sea. Gail wants to follow up, and, and I'll try and bring you in, Scott, uh, on, on the back of Gail's follow up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask about reducing food waste as well. What contribution will the strategy make to reducing food waste by a third by 2025? You'd like to, Scott, would you like to... Uh, take, take both questions uh, uh, quickly. If we go back to climate change, one of, one of the strange things for me in terms of the carbon emission figures is you have in agriculture emissions and you have a land use uh, emissions. Now, land use for us is generally sequestration of, of carbon. Agriculture doesn't get any credit for that. That goes into land use figures. We simply get all the emissions from agriculture. So I would ask anyone when they do have a look at the carbon emissions figures from agriculture, they actually have a look at the land use as well and combine the two. 
<coughs> and also when we talk about climate change going, going forward, the industry does have a number of initiatives in place, whether it be BVD eradication and different schemes, which is all about increasing the efficiency of, of agricultural production, which ultimately helps us in terms of our, our CO2 emissions. In terms of food waste, uh, the others will have come from a different angle, but one of the bits I would highlight is the waste that takes place from farm to the processor. Now, a lot of the products that are produced on the farm are totally fine for the processor, but because of the specifications that are put in place, there's a lot of rejection take, to, you know, happens. And what we've got to be looking at as an industry is how do we, one, change consumers' attitude, so products that they reject just now because a Brussels sprout is less than 20 millimetres in size or greater than 40 millimetres in size, people won't buy, but fundamentally nothing wrong with it. And how do we then take those products also that may be out of spec and look at adding value to them in the, in, in the future? Okay. Um, yeah, I just quickly have one more. Thanks. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Kay, we're going to have to move oh, on to Rhoda. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, we've heard about um, the profits to primary producers, but also workers within the industry um, tend not to be paid um, what you would say living wages. They don't have um, um, work, work opportunities that provide a sustainable income and that's why it's quite difficult to get people within the industry and keep them there. It tends to be seasonal, low paid and the like. On the other hand, end of the spectrum, we have people getting food from food banks because food is expensive and unaffordable to some people. But yet in the middle, we're saying that this could be the primary profitable sector in Scotland. Someone's making money somewhere, but how do we tackle food poverty and indeed poverty on the basis of those working in the industry? want to um, tackle that? Scott Walker. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's one of these... Yeah. <laughs> it may give your colleagues the time to, to gather their thoughts. Yeah. I, I, I was hoping you were going to choose Scott Lansborough <laughs> yeah, at the beginning. Um, I, well, a couple of things I would highlight. In terms of any agricultural worker, they get paid the highest minimum rate of pay. That's, that's, that's there. So the, the minimum rate of pay in agriculture is actually higher than the rest of, rest of the economy. It's not a living wage. Well, so, so well, we've, we've got, say, the Agriculture Wages Board in, in agriculture, and the minimum rate of pay for agriculture is set at the national living wage, regardless of your age. And then at the same time, there's a higher rate of pay in agriculture for people that have more, more experience. So I'm not saying there isn't more we can do, but we do have a higher base rate than ever, anyone else. The problem that, say, the farming has tends to be about the low margins, you know, in terms of, you know, the ability to pay, to, to pay more. In terms of, say, uh, food and the price of, of food, I, I come from a slightly different angle in that food for society as a whole has never been cheaper. If you look at the percentage uh, that people pay on their food in terms of disposable income, it's lower than it has ever been, been in the past. I think there is a wider societal problem in terms of people having the opportunity to progress, the opportunity to, to earn enough that allows them to purchase what's, what's, what's out there. But food per se is actually exceptionally cheap, I think, in this country, if you go back through throughout history. To follow up on that, or I, I, I just um, there is profit here somewhere. Uh, Stuart Stevenson was talking about producers and what they get from basic production, but the workers are also. I mean, it's seasonal. It's uh, you know we talk about a crisis and Brexit and migrant workers and who tend to be lower paid. The industry has to somewhere have a workforce that is well recognised, well recompensed for their efforts um, because somewhere in the middle the profit is coming out because it is a profitable industry but it's not it, it's not reflected either in the price or indeed the the, the, the wages to workers. Uh, at your suggestion I'm going to go to the other Scott to give you a chance to, to gather your thoughts. Uh, Scott Lansbury, do you want to answer? I'd uh, help him out. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, the model in the salmon industry at the moment, and we, we're not, we don't employ a lot of people, it's not labour intensive uh, any longer, but um, 
we're all signed up to living wage, and uh, and every farm unit now uh, is is a kind of a business unit on of it of its own, and uh, everyone's targeted on yield, and everyone gets a share of of profit uh, on on the business unit. So there's an incentive. Uh, you know, it's the basic uh, for, for the basic farm worker, if you like, they're getting the living wage, but they're undoubtedly going to get some incentive on top of that, uh, and it's an incentive to, uh, you know, ensure that there's uh, high productivity, uh, which seems to work pretty well. But I would also uh, counter on the profitability thing. Uh, this is a capital-intensive industry. We talked about capital and the, and the frustrations with uh, getting access to capital before. Profit has to be sustainable as well, in in any industry, in any sector. And we, we you know, I, I fear some of the political discourse in the UK in general, in this country, is that profit's becoming a dirty word. Profit isn't a dirty word if it's used properly, and we have to recognise that it's there to maintain sustainability. I take your point about making sure that everyone has a living, decent wage and and decent incentives. Uh, which is the model we, we, we try to work with, but also, you know, investors need to get a return, otherwise they'll go elsewhere. I'm just going to move, if I may, to the final theme, which is Jamie, and then there is one question at the end. Jamie. Thank you. Um, so, I think just to, to summarise uh, a lot of what we've talked about today and looking forward to the future, we know that the Scottish food and drink industries are supported by quite wide and varied public bodies and organisations at local level, Scottish government, UK government, and e even the EU, um, with a variety of grants, loans, and funds available to them. But bringing it back to this parliament, what do you think the top priority should be for the Scottish government to help the industry meet its ambition of doubling uh, its value from 14 billion to 30 billion in the next 13 years? So what, would be, what should be their single top priority? And it could be a one word or one sentence answer, I don't mind. James, do you want to start on that? Um, so I suppose, strangely, because industry normally sit here and say we need more money, please, and support, and I'll, I'll maybe come on to one suggestion on that in a second. Uh, it's actually a mindset thing. It's this, uh, this uh, approach and collaboration which says industry will give you the space to lead and set out the strategy and we will align our resources behind that. That sounds, yeah, a bit soft and fluffy, but as a principle, it's been a total game changer. So we're, we're, you know, we're given that space to say, in export markets, these are the eight markets that matter. We only want to go here. Can you back us, please? And, and that's happened. Um, w one thing, though, actually, that um, you know, we, we talked a lot about supply chains. Um, and the one thing that, that, that I, I've learned from supply chains is you need honest brokers in there to make things happen. Uh, if, a, if a processor wants to develop a more collaborative supply chain, farmers are suspicious. If the farmers want to drive it, the processors are suspicious. If retailers want to do it, everyone's suspicious. So you bring in the honest broker that works between them, and particularly the work that SUS have done before. Now, there's a new million pound scheme launching in that. I think we're scratching at the surface. My, my one request within all of that, um, I presume the, the, does the committee review the draft budget each year from a rural economy point yes. of view. There's £6 million in the food industry development budget. Now, we're pretty happy with that because it didn't used to be a budget five, six, seven years ago for food and drink industry development. Um, we would ra really value the committee looking at that because there is lots of investment going in from lots of different places, but that core fund there that sits in the food and drink policy team in the Scottish Government, we need, we need greater resource in there because that's what can drive more work in a home market in particular and more work in the supply chain development. And at the moment, it's £6 million you know, there's a £30 billion pound ambition, and I think more resource within there, which would be even a doubling of that, which is tiny in the grand scheme of things, could make a big difference to tackling some of the priorities we've talked about, particularly around supply chain. Um, so, does one other person, uh, Scott, I'll let, if you'd like to come in on that. Yeah, well, a, a concern I, I have to say going, going forward is we've got a huge ambition here to, to double uh, the val value of the food, food and drink industry in, in Scotland. But that's all based on there being actual agricultural production. So if we don't have agricultural production, it's going to be very, very difficult to double the value of, of the entire, entire industry. So I would ask you that we've got powers coming back to Scotland by developing our own agricultural policy. What we've got to do is have a look at that agriculture policy we develop here is focused on, on output, is actually focused on producing more on our farms so we can achieve the ambition which is in the strategy. Okay, and it, it, just 
to sum that up, if I may, with a fi final question, which, which is my question of it, is Scott uh, has talked about increasing production. Uh, Scott Walker's in, it talked about increasing production. He, James Withers has talked about doubling turnover. More, more pounds, which comes actually from the bottom line, I think, that Scott Walker's made, is more product is required. Uh, which needs to be sustainable, which, which has also been mentioned. The problem is, is it appears that industry seems to be hamstrung in the sense that agricultural output, not only on beef, on cereal production and lamb production or sheep production, has virtually flatlined in the last 10 years. You, Scott, have talked about the fact that you are struggling uh, to get any expansion to your industry, but the, there's the market out there for it. I, I would like one suggestion from each of the producing areas that how we're going to get more product to allow us to develop, develop the huge turnover that you're suggesting <laughs> is capable. Scott, if you want to start left, left right. my left to your, to, to your right. Specifically for my sector, it's about um, getting the, the planning and licensing uh, pr um, process streamlined. We're, it, it's, we're, we're on that journey now. Uh, I'm quite hopeful, but it, it's taking time. But uh, you know, the Scottish Government, Marine Scotland and SEPA are working closely with us. And uh, if we can get that and we get to the right locations and control our biological challenges, we will get our production to the level that will double the value. Yeah, yeah I mean, mine would be uh, quite simple, incentivize uh, innovation at, at farm level, particularly farm level I'm interested in, but incentivize innovation along with collaboration at the same time. And I think, you know, farming can respond to all these change drivers, but uh, generally we need to put the incentive in place to encourage that kind of behaviour. Okay. David, do you have a... Um, yeah, Brexit and, and the, uh, is going to mean that government's going to have to pay attention to food much more than it's, it's ever done. Uh, and so, actually, what James uh, has says has been built up over the, the past 10 years um, is soft and fluffy. It will not be soft and fluffy anymore. It will be very much about um, how we produce food and how we um, manage regulations and trading arrangements and all those sorts of things going forward. So government needs to be resourced uh, in order to deliver on that. Patrick. Uh, protecting the wild catching sector going forward and uh, providing uh, appropriate support to the processing sector to maximise that opportunity. James. Um, I suppose the comments of colleagues have talked about um, increasing production and increasing supply. We need to keep increasing demand. So development, market development activity in international markets and in home market. And a big part of the growth will come from premiumisation. It won't it will be value as well as just uh, volume. So developing the brand and in those markets will be a key part of the growth piece. Okay, Scott. Um, ultimately, it's very simple. Uh, at the far farmer end, uh, they need a price signal. They need better prices. You know, we need the supply chain to develop fair pricing throughout, and that's what Scotland Food and Drinks here to do, build that trust and develop better pricing throughout the supply chain. Thank you. Um, that's been a long session, but extremely worthwhile. I, I'd like to thank you all uh, for, for coming in. If, if anyone feels that we've missed out on something, I'm afraid I don't have the time or the luxury to give you the chance to contribute now, but you can, of course, write to... Uh, the committee clerks and that will be passed on so thank you very much uh, for your time this morning and i'd briefly like to suspend the meeting uh, to allow the witnesses to leave
Thank you. We'll now reconvene the meeting and move on to agenda item three, subordinate legislation. This is the consideration of a negative instrument as detailed on the agenda. Members should note that there have been no motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument and no representations to the committee on them. Are there any comments from members? Is the committee therefore agreed it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Amen. That is agreed. That concludes today's committee business. Thank you.